come to order here. Welcome to the uh, Tuesday night, October 24th, Board of Selectmen meeting. We'll begin as we always do with selecting liaison reports, any public comment, and then I'll turn to the town manager for his report. Tonight we have uh, uh, about eight topics. The first is a change of manager at Chili's. The second is to hear from Sharon Angstrom in the town accountant's quarterly report. Uh, hear from Victor Santaniello on senior tax relief and as well a preview of tax classification. The board will then take up again the subject matter of depot and compost sticker fees, which was discussed in um, either the last meeting or the meeting prior. Uh, we'll vote warrant articles and we'll discuss the town manager review, which is now uh, collated and in our packet tonight, and then the approval of two sets of minutes uh, to close out. <coughs> Uh, with that, I'll turn to my left for liaison reports. Andrew. Thanks, John. I attended a trails committee meeting last week. They spoke primarily about the males in Massachusetts trails conference in which they were uh, preparing a presentation, pretty good presentation. Um, I just wanted, I, I wanted to sort of advertise the trails committee and the trails in town. Uh, we have trails that cover about 462 acres of free open space. The uh, Trails Committee maintains about 10 miles of trails, uh, much of it through uh, wildlife filled um, wetland areas. Um, they, they, have, they have about a $1,000 budget from the town each year that they, they've supplemented over the last several years with about $39,000 uh, $39, of grants, which I thought was really excellent. Um, and I heard a lot about how they worked with uh, the CONCOM, Conservation Committee, Open Land Trust, and DPW. Uh, all in all, a, a great meeting, and these are people who take their, seer, their trails very seriously. So. Thanks, Andrew. Barry. Uh, yeah, it was a busy interim. Um, I think it was a week ago Saturday, I actually attended a reception uh, for Friends of the Library at the library. Um, and um, Amy and her staff have done an absolutely tremendous job. Usage is um, exploding record in terms of number of people coming and using that facility. Um, and it's intergenerational. It's not just school kids. It's not just elderly. It's everybody. Um, it was a well-attended event. Um, they're, um, you know, they're raising some money on their own. It's um, I, I think we really hit a home run with that. Um, uh, also, I've been attending the CP, CPTC meetings, um, and um, mostly the last couple of items have been the Gould Street project. Um, the developers come in, has made some changes, neighbors have been there. It's, um, it's been a little testy, um, but for the most part, people have been polite. Um, CPTC has kind of pushed back a little bit and asked the developer to make some changes. Um, and he's doing that. I think um, at their next meeting in November, I think the final vote of discussion should be um, imminent on that. Um, I also, along with most of you here, attended the Yes for Reading kickoff. The organizers did a really tremendous job in sort of organizing kind of um, some, you know, for the, for the cases uh, to be made for putting an override in front of the voters. Um, there were um, a lot of the stuff we know, obviously, from just being on the town side. They had a number of um, uh, teachers and administrators at the school talk about sort of the day-to-day -day life at the schools. And um, it was really kind of eye-opening about how really that they're really kind of um, operating, um, really tough to kind of get their jobs done. And so, so real heartfelt um, testimony on what's going on there on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and what else? Um, I don't know, I was out every night last week, I can't remember <laughs> what it all was, but you know, that's pretty much the gist of it. Great, thank you. John. Uh, yeah, I can, um, I'm gonna speak about the recreation tonight, a couple okay. of things. Um, I typically am unable to attend the meetings but stay close because they meet essentially right at this time. So they tend to meet on top of us often. Um, but one thing that I think is extremely important that all four of you here and anybody in the room or watching us on TV needs to be aware of. Um, there's been a bit of a problem with some of the users 
um, of the um, of the turf fields by and I say not problems with the field, but problems in that they're forgetting to turn off the lights. The lights are managed through a you know through a, through a phone application that and the responsibility of the of the tenant that night is to shut the lights off. Less than I'll shut I, have, the lights. I have noticed that. And so the reason it's so important to talk about this out loud is to understand that the town does not pay for lights to stay on overnight. And that's really kind of important given, you know, the kinds of conversations that we've been having about managing the way we spend money, uh, taking a hard look at where we put expenses out. I think it's important for everybody to understand that when those lights go on for anything other than a school event, that a meter starts to run, and that meter will be charged to the renting to the renting organization. Mm -hmm. So when they choose to forget to turn the lights off, um, they're running their own bill, and it's very important, I think, for people in town to understand that that's not, you know, the absence of oversight by government. I will, however, say to you that um, it's happened with enough frequency now, um, recently that the um, Recreation Committee will be taking up a policy as to how to deal with that particular tenant. Um, and I think that's important. I've urged them uh, to create a policy that would say, if a tenant does this once, it's, geez, if we're sorry, of course you're gonna pay. Does it twice, then it's, you know, maybe a different discussion. But throughout, the tenant is paying that bill. And it's important for everybody in town to understand that and should that question come up to any of the four of you, it's important for you to know that. Um, so uh, recreation will be taking that up as to what kind of a policy going forward they need to initiate around that, that particular <coughs> topic. So um, the other thing that... Um, John, before you go any farther, does that yeah. meter allow them to assign those costs to that specific yes. user? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So there's a penalty that individual pays. I have no idea if it's significant. Well, the penalty is, more, so if you turn the lights on and they cost, yeah. pick a number, if they cost uh, $50 an hour, let's say, <coughs> and you decide to leave them on until somebody notices it at, you know, 10 o'clock the next morning, the, meter's running. the meter is running, <coughs> and that organization will be paying that bill. Um, but, you know, the concern that I had, and, and I think rightfully the Recreation Committee, yeah. in, in light of the way that, you know, town is working hard to manage expenses. And, you know, perception sometimes becomes a reality. I mean, if a neighbor like Dan looks out the window and sees the lights on, you know, uh, at midnight when he's, you know, ready to go to bed, you kind of wonder, why is somebody leaving the lights on? Um, so. I, I just think it's important for for it to be said out loud in this forum, yep. um, you know, kind of how that all works. The other thing that's going on at recreation <coughs> that I think is very important is that um, the Birch Meadow Committee um, is coming back together in active um, meetings, um, and I think that's important as you look forward, um, so that you know people in town meeting. <laughs> You know, citizens are aware as reports come out what work is left undone, what suggestions are being made about how to use that, you know, uh, that Birch Meadow complex. Um, and frankly, in the transition between um, leadership, there was a, a time when it slowed off, slowed down a little bit. Um, and because there's a lot of ground to cover, um, the committee of which I am a member um, will is meeting this Saturday, actually, um, at 9.30. And the idea is we'll meet till we, you know, get something done. And, you know, as you guys all know, sometimes you start a meeting at 7.30 at night and you've got a lot of ground to cover and the hour gets late and, and there's competing meetings and so you can make one, but you can only make a half hour of the other one. Um, the idea here was that the members of that committee agreed that a Saturday morning made some sense. So that's going to be going on as well. And uh, that's really all I have for liaison at this time. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last Wednesday, the Board of Health held a public hearing on uh, 
uh, the use of pesticides on town-owned property. They cannot legislatively regulate that, but what they're looking to do is get uh, some guidelines over to the selectmen uh, if the selectmen should choose to so adopt some such regulations. Uh, they're going to follow that up with uh, a vote and some more detail. Uh, I did caution that our upcoming agendas are pretty well filled and we're going to get into budgets in December, so maybe looking at 2018 before we can get to that. Uh, second item, uh, the process that Barry has heard this, uh, for filling board committee commission uh, vacancies, we're doing a holistic look at this. We're looking across all the boards, all the commissions, mm -hmm. at both the associate and the full memberships. We historically have not really advertised for associates. It's kind of been filled as a side sidebar to what we do. So we're going to, uh, Caitlin's actually, I think, calculating the, at the upper number for each board of, of associates it's, it's a formula. And uh, once that list is finalized, it's in the final stages, we will advertise it as an omnibus advertisement. And then the VASC will meet periodically uh, starting at the 15-day point as resumes start coming in. And I assume in the listing that you do that states the current occupants of those roles, you have the current occupants of the associate members open, if any. Yes. Some of that you do today, I know, but yeah. mm -hmm. it may not be universally. Yeah, I mean, the, that, I mean, I, so that's a, I forgot to talk. It's a great point because, um, as you know, you know, we're, we're, we're a town that has dozens of committees and commissions, and um, if we just wait till there's, um, if we wait until that there's an opening, then you advertise it, and then you get resumes, and then we have to meet, um, you know, it's just, it, it's kind of a really inefficient and haphazard way to do it. If we just look overall, what is, what is it that we can fill? What's the potential? We'll start to get resumes in there. We'll start to develop a bench yeah. in terms of um, people who are going to have experience on these committees. It's, it's important that, um, you know, that we get some turnover from time to time, new ideas, fresh ideas, new people move to town, they want to contribute. And if we can interview as many people as we can and try to basically plug people into roles that they have an interest in and that they have some talent in, I think it will go a long way um, in really augmenting kind of what we have here. So and, and it's important to point out that the associate memberships on these boards now have more uh, responsibilities and rights potentially. Uh, an associate member at the uh, request of the chair could be elevated to voting status if there's a temporary or permanent opening on the, on the full membership of the board. So. Uh, and that has been done uh, by many boards and commissions recently. So, come on, come on, we'll get that out. It, Bob, will that be up on the website? Uh, yeah, probably next week. Okay. And, I, we should, and we should probably advertise that we're doing it too, because there's sometimes yeah. people just might see there might be one ad for one opening right. that, that people may or may well, not see. This will be a big ad. But if we just do this and just say, listen, we're, yeah. we really want your ideas and we yeah. want your participation, and I think it'll generate. A lot of interest from people, and you know, maybe it's not the right opening or the right time for them. But at least now we get to kind of see who's out there and, and really try to recruit people to fill some of these roles. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Um, like I think all of my colleagues, I participated in the October 11th uh, Financial Forum too. A fascinating uh, evening. Um, also participated in the S for Reading on October Reading on October 17th. <coughs> I attended the uh, HRAC meeting on October 12th. Um, HRAC intends to, uh, I believe together with um, the uh, uh, RED group, support Martin Luther King's um, day celebration in early January. More to come on that. Um, I watched with interest the CPDC video that, uh, from Monday night. It looked like it was a packed room. and. Uh, I'm glad to see the public discourse going on. I understand this whole, the emotions are running high. Um, the Smart Growth District was gives the um, property owners much more rights and levers to pull than would be the case were at a 40 B. Yep. And the abutters, you mean? The abutters, yep. and it's it's up to um, and the town. And, and this is our first time through it, so I think some of the frustration really comes from the first time through. There isn't um, the design guard guidelines aren't established. The uh, abutters haven't really weighed in on, on to the full extent of what's possible to do, and I'm sure there's more um, that can be done. Frankly, that hasn't been asked for. Uh, question for the board: yes. um, The results of the selectmen's survey are. Um, 
almost an informative review, and I would like to sample your ability and willingness to meet on November 14th, which is a uh, Wednesday night? Yeah, it's a Tuesday. It should be the in-between Tuesday. Right, next sorry. Tuesday. The in-between Tuesday at 7.30, not our usual 7. We will review a, uh, a presentation. Um, I got to look at, at an early, very early version of it um, from Jane Miller. Um, and the tw these are the 12 questions that have not heretofore been reviewed in public. You might remember these questions were multiple choice. They were intended to be get a sense of where the community was in a range of potential outcomes. So they're much more useful in my mind in terms of sampling the sense of the community. The comments are wonderful. It tells you how a single individual thinks and you aggregate those, you get some very good data as well. But these are more <coughs> quantitative. Or no. Um, so I'd, I'd like to suggest we we will meet on uh, November 14th together with school committee, FinCom, who's been invited, and library trustees who've been invited. Uh, room to be determined, Bob, or do you think we can fit everyone in? Library. Um, it depends on whether uh, both those boards will come, this room otherwise. Okay. So is this a board of selectmen meeting, or is this a joint meeting? this would be a workshop, would call for quorum. They'd we'll all, all post, I would guess. Uh, we'll it would, post. I, you know, when we talked about this, and I intentionally deferred, knowing that you'd want to talk about this, um, because we were assigned together to take a look at what was going on and come up with some ideas. It struck me that, you know, just having a special selectmen's meeting, whatever we call it, um, and invite um, other elected, certain other elected boards and certainly the FinCom, um, and have it as a single topic meeting. I mean, there's a lot of ground to cover. I mean, and yeah. getting, getting, getting a cursory look at that, there's a lot of ground so, to cover. So a couple of questions. So the data has been collated in terms of the 11, 12 questions. Has any attempt been made to sort of cross-correlate between certain answers between demographic groups? I mean, to me, that's where the real yes. sauce is. So it has some of that's been done. There's more that can be done. The tool allows you to drill down okay. ad nauseum. Um, it's, the <laughs> conclusions at the primary level are interesting alone by themselves, and uh, the tool's available for any of us that want to do more work. There are also a and, and we'll get that ahead of time. Um, I presume yes. we can do that. You know, a lot of it's packet. online and interactive, so yeah. I have to think about that. What um, John and John saw last week was a live view of the website, right. going through the website and all the data. That's easy enough to do yeah. here. It's pretty hard to preview that in advance. I'd, we'll I'd think also, of a way. Yeah, I'd also say two things. One is there's a narrative that needs to be created for each of the 12 questions. It's one thing to say, here's the data. Yeah. It's another thing to point out the three or four conclusions one can draw. And I'm not talking about opinions. I'm talking about what does the data tell a, a independent thinker. Um, and those have to be created and appended. And I think the most important part of this, if you can only pick one, is actually the narratives. The data supports the narratives. The data's got more conclusions. But you want the two to come out together, people to see the narratives and see the data and see the comments in all one fell And it doesn't presuppose your conclusion. Right. So in other words, so, yeah. a, a narrative, like a one or two sentence narrative that says, you know, draw your attention to this bar graph and this set of data and the amount of people responding. Um, the narrative, I think, which is what we actually, you know, the outcome of our meeting was a suggestion that we get a very short narrative as a basis of discussion going forward. So, I think all of us, any one of us individually, might you know come up with other observations. Um, you know, some more so, drilling down, as Bob points out. So these narratives aren't designed to lead people in a certain direction. No, not at all. <coughs> so this is the kind of thing where I show you a chart. Subjective, charts. not a, these are. I mean, objective. These are objective. Totally objective narrative sentences about what you're seeing. To because as Bob points out, I think it's going to be difficult to, like, like Barry, I'm, I'm sure you'd like to sit with this thing for a couple of hours and, yeah. you know, come, to your, actually, come yeah. to your own conclusions, and I'm sure you would. I mean, I, I found it to be very interesting as we met in subcommittee to do that. Um, the narrative is not designed to replace, to replace yeah. that. Okay. It's designed to create an, an immediate conversation point absent the ability to be able to each, each of us individually spend two or three hours. It kind of creates the discussion. I think that's what it does anyways, creates the discussion right. points, and then um, we I, can, I, I we can process it from there. I don't think it'll be controversial at all in the narratives. The, um, however, I do think it will be a minimum of two and a half to three and a half hours. There's a lot. This is a data-rich environment. Yeah. Okay. Just the comments alone, I, we didn't get through them all. I think we got through one question. Just so much commentary. 
Um, lastly, um, unlike um, earlier distributions, I don't intend for this to be made public before it's made public. And so my preference would be that uh, it be presented here the night of the 14th. Yeah, I, we may call for another meeting Absolutely. as a yeah, follow-up. Right? Because you know, in the absence of that, if you just dump the data in the community, you lose any context. I, I would like to have a look at it before That's fine. the meeting. That's I, fine. I just, you know, I need time to think it and process it. Ask the, it's fine. the okay, Should it be viewed in camera here at Town Hall? Uh, perhaps I don't know. I don't I have no objection to the, to the board reviewing it. I just yeah. have an objection to it getting published. No, I think yeah. I mean, I, it, it, it should be. Uh, it's got to have the narrative attachment to before right. it actually um, goes out. Absolutely. But I just think the, the, the you know, it is a selectman's. It is. Yeah, it right is right. a selectman's yep. uh, survey, and the selectman, <laughs> the selectman, would like to kind of see it before no anyone else does. We have, so. Maybe is there an accommodation we can make over the next couple I, of weeks? I have to think of how to best package that. You know, it's easy to do it live. It's a little challenging, but I'll think of a way. You know, Bob, you may not be able to package it. It may require. You have to print out a lot of the stuff you saw. On, but you know, you're well, talking about a book or a visit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can make myself available. Well, there'll be some sort yeah. of an executive summary developed at some point. I think that would um, be important. That could take. You know, when, as we no, discussed it, each person what, what was, again, mean? free to draw their own conclusions. Hmm. And, and some of us did. But we were really focused on how do we present this so other people can then quickly get to the point of how do I interpret this and come to my conclusions. Um, we spent a couple hours with Jane uh, Miller and Matt Cornelis educating us on what the tool was, right. was telling us. Mm -hmm. And then you can draw conclusions. And that's that's the point could of they the do, narrative. Could they do the executive summary? I mean, it just sort um, of they'll like, work on it. I'll work on it. Um, <laughs> The idea is again, something like this. You can you can pick a corner of the whole project and turn it into its own news article. That's not the point. That's a tiny piece of a big thing. You've got to look at the whole thing first and then do whatever you want. And, and Barry, the tool is so flexible. You can, in terms of, you can say, what about this parade or what about that parade? Or you don't get that in print form. You only get that in the mm -hmm. native tool. Okay. I'd recommend you actually see yeah. it natively. I mean, I've seen. I mean, I've done these, and I've seen, basically they're Excel sheets that have. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. The most useful way to present it that we looked at there is they, was the same way you got the comments, yes, no, didn't vote. So look at all the questions in terms of, for those that said yes, how did they answer all the questions? Statistically, quantitatively, qualitatively, same with the no's, mm -hmm. and same with the didn't votes. Um, because if you just look at the whole body, um, the no voters were underrepresented in the survey, not surprisingly, uh, by quite a bit. So you can't just conclude from the whole package the what the town thinks. You anyway. But you can conclude what the yes voters right. think, what the no voters think, and what those that didn't vote right. think. Because the reason, I mean, the reason why we constructed the survey the way we did is that we didn't want to just find out who voted for what. We wanted to know why you yes. voted a certain way. And, 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 what would, what, and what information would you need to potentially change your mind? Correct. So, Correct. I, so yeah, I hope that would be able to be garnered from the information. I think you'll, I think it is. And, and um, my personal opinion is, um, although I held out the possibility that a, a second survey might be needed, I now don't believe that's the case. I think this is pretty compelling. I would agree with that based on what I saw. Yeah. Before we move on, uh, I noticed there's an item missing from our upcoming agendas, Bob. It's the cable TV hearing. Yeah, Matt's still, is Matt around? Um, Matt's still trying to work with town council to find out what is the legal requirement. Oh, all right. So, so there may not be a legal requirement. We don't know. Well, we don't know what it is if there is one. Um, RCTV's process to date may have taken the take care of the legal requirement. That's what we're trying to figure. Ms. Alvarado has one. <coughs> Bessa. Uh, Bessa Alvarado, Grand State. Um, will the results be available to the school committee and the finance committee in advance of the workshop on the 14th, so we can review the data as well? Without. That's a good question. That's I, gonna be difficult. I think it's going to be difficult. With a crowd that big, it's, um, it's going to be impossible to control. What I'm desperately fearful of is what Bob described. Somebody takes one comment out of one section and blows it into an issue. And what you need to stu do is back up as a whole and review it. I will tell you, not having seen it before, it didn't suffer for immediacy. Looking at it the first time, you don't suffer for not having seen it before. You might. It might take you a while to stitch the numbers together or to stitch the conclusions. But that's what the narrative help should do. Um, so I, I don't think you lose anything for not having seen it in advance. Bob? I think the other conclusion that um, I, you know, I, I couldn't tell, but they reached on Thursday was 
since there's, I mean, there's not a need for another survey, that changes the whole dynamic of how quickly you need to digest this one. Um, this one needs to be basically digested by the end of January or the middle of January. So selectmen in December, school committee by, uh, yeah. by January, FinCom in February. So given that there's not going to be another survey launched in another month, I think that changes. It can be really thoughtfully looked at. And what I would view November 14th is as the start of that process, quite honestly. Um, I agree with John that is because I was seeing a lot of the data for right. the first time as you were that there's a lot of things you think of, you look at but honestly there's a lot of things you think about as you heard the discussion as you see the data it's going to be an iterative process over a period of time I believe this 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 data is very rich it's very deep you can't summarize it on one or two pages it's just impossible and that's the risk is that someone tries to do that mm -hmm. so will the uh, summaries along commentary and the raw data be available then? Uh, I'll, I'll try to come up with sort of that summary uh, along with the other staff I mentioned that doesn't necessarily lead to a conclusion. Um, and there's certainly no reason that can't be shared um, in advance. Um, I'll have to think about how else to present the data just practically. Um, yeah, well, I think I think what, maybe I don't want to put words in your mouth, Vanessa, but I think what I heard her ask was would all of it be it's open a, for after the 14th, review on the 14th, and, I, and yes, on the 14th, yes. After the 14th, in reviewing, yes. What, you know, I don't know how to do that before. I need to think about it. Well, you know, I think that if we reflect back on the subcommittee meeting that we had, yeah, um, I think our goal on the 14th was not to put it to bed, right? But to reiterate what you're saying, it was to open the yeah. dialogue, right? And yeah. once that dialogue is open with a with a short narrative um, at the end of each one of the, you know, unanswered, the unexposed 12 questions, um, what it does is it creates the talking place to begin. And so I, we pressed, when we talked about in that subcommittee meeting, an early return just for that reason, so that everybody could kind of get their hands on these things. And once we do that, it's now, I'm guessing, would be on the website. At well, some point, sure. Some point. Yeah, because it becomes, at that point, you're having public the only meetings, problem is it's a so now it becomes part of the public domain. Now you can start digging in and seeing what that means, because the tool was designed to understand where the voters, you know, to your earlier point, Barry, where are the vote, what are they thinking, you know, and what is the collection of thinking? But you have to keep in mind that although 2,000 people responded, which is really exceptional when you stop to think about it. I mean, that kind of return on a survey with 19,000 voters is almost unheard of. But it was skewed as to, you know, those who said they voted yes right. versus those who voted no. That's why it's and good to organize the data that way. Yeah, and, and it and is organized yeah. that way. So I think it's use, I think it's useful as a tool. That's, it's, you can't draw conclusions from any of it. The, the other thing is each of the 12 questions is asked of the three subgroups, did you vote yes, did you vote no, did you not vote? And the comments are coordinated in the same way. So you have 12 questions with three groups, so you have 36 sets of comments, and the total number of comments, I bet, is over 1,000 still. Well, so there was 32 pages of single space yeah, for, the for one, one question. question. For the one question. This is a whole other set of comments, separate and distinct from the ones right. you've already seen. I think 1,000 is a is an underestimation yeah, it might be by a lot. Yeah, it to 1,200, but it's, that is really data rich, and it's, you can't separate the comments until you have the question and you understand the question that's been asked. It's really hard to take the, the comments out in a vacuum and figure out what it is they're talking about. That's the problem. And if we put it in a flat file on the web, which I support, you won't have that interactivity that you do with the tool. So I'm, I'm not sure what the best way to do I, it is. I think as soon as you sit down and go through what these two went through Thursday, you'll totally understand what it is. But it has to be done here live. Yeah. Uh, interactive tour. You know, there's no such thing right now as a file or a folder or anything. It's, it's all live. It's an on online database that yep. someone else has managed. So. And the challenge will be to make it something that people can see on the website and understand. That's going to be the challenge. Well, it's not a policy setting document. No, and, and we'll take all. a stab at that for the 14th, no, but then we'll listen to all your input right. as to how to do a better job uh, for the general public because Quite honestly, there's far too much uh, detailed information in there to create an easy summary. 
one comment is if we have it in this room, that screen probably isn't good enough for that kind of community. If there's a way to get the community room at the library, they have a slightly better. With a better PA system. With, well, yeah, PA you system. You want to hear it, you want to see, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll see where it finds All right. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, the, um, you know, the senior center has a screen two or three times that size. Right. But can RCTV, can RCTV broadcast from there? The screen content. Not live. All right. Um, they get it up Mr. Quick. Chair, before, sure. before you move away from uh, liaison reports, um, you mentioned um, HRAC and just some MLK stuff. Um, anything in there in the meeting you attended? Where are we in terms of um, where uh, organization wise? I know that their sunset is coming up. Actually, Any progress on that? I, I'd really like to. Good point. I, um, hear that. It's not in tonight's packet, but um, I'm actually in favor of extending the um, the. the um, sunset date for another year. There's been good progress made, um, and I'm, I'm satisfied that we're going to get through this. A track is down a couple of members, and I think uh, um, there'll be resources to fill that in, uh, reinforcements to fill that in. But I'm in favor of extending the, uh, the sunset date again, this time in a 12-month period. Um, so that'll be, have to be on a warrant uh, in the future. Okay. Future meeting. Yeah, take that up later. But in terms of the MLK, the group's excited about the prospect yeah, of doing it. There, there are um, funds collected previously, which are stored on the school side, um, and the group is, is talking about fundraising again for the event this time as well. Okay, because obviously they've been doing that for a while, and there's other needs that that group needs to address. And I just want to make sure that they have the the bandwidth as well as the runway to get that done. So, um, okay. Um, lastly, um, I have a personal announcement. Um, I will be a candidate for Board of Selectmen um, an additional term. Normally candidates announce uh, later in the year. I'm choosing to announce tonight, uh, primarily because we're in a much different environment than in prior years. We have the subject matter of the override. We have the subject matter of uh, economic development. And these are both important topics that I've been involved with along with other members of the board. I'm very interested in staying engaged um, and I look forward to the support of the community. Um, the website's up, Facebook's up, social networking's up. My team's been active for quite a while, so um, more to come. Thank you very much. Any other comments before we move on? Public comment. Bill. Bill Brown, 28 uh, what's the status on Memorial Park and the land across the nation? Has the town council had an opportunity to look at it yet? Memorial, Memorial Park, yes. Um, Oakland Road, it's really up to the selectmen to decide what process to use and what the options are. Because I understand that the town treasurer can sell it anyway, so you have to walk away. Because legally, yes. Legally, yes, but he wouldn't have a job tomorrow. I don't know. He'd probably still have a job. I think it's important to say that nobody can sell it until town meeting approves it. Uh, Actually, I legally he can't. Legally he can't. He, can. he, he won't. He can't. <laughs> don't. Please don't. Approved to sell it in 1937. That's all right. On the matter of Memorial Park, is, is Ray intended yes. to look on this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. He left me a message I wasn't able to return yeah. yesterday that he wanted to talk to me about. What's so. the outlook date? When would you guess he might have an opinion? I assume before town meeting. Um, was it an instructional motion? I don't know. I, I know you asked me. I agree to it, and I think these guys agreed that they were going to look at come back to it. Um, I still got my town report, by the way, so. <laughs> we'll get the information <coughs> as soon as you need. Yeah, at the worst, it'll be November town meeting. I'm going to okay. find, you know, we have an obligation if it was an instructional motion to give an update at town meeting. Right. I, I don't remember that we did that as an instructional motion. Okay. Mr. Halsey was talking about the. Uh, Resurrecting Memorial Park. It's only been since 1930, John, that that's kind of review. Yeah, that, that's. What is it that I said? Uh, you said about the, the committee really the looking Meadow. at it again, Birch Meadow again. The, we're, well, the, yeah, there is a Birch Meadow committee. Yeah, to, I know, but it's only been since 1930, so everybody <laughs> just reinventing the wheel. And well, 
don't we have to be in a, in a constant dynamic, Bill? Don't yeah. we have to always be adapting and moving forward? So the yeah, fact that we've only been doing it since 1932 yeah. bothers me. We possibly should have been doing it since 1639. <laughs> Uh, we wouldn't have to appoint a selector. Well, if I read the town uh, charter correctly, you have to report appoint a selector. Look at this. Count that. Equity. We could run it ourselves. Oh, okay. If you want to cross in uh, uh, the charter area, I'll let you know. Okay. Any other public comment? <laughs> okay. Seeing none. Bob? A couple things. Um, I want to remind the community about this Sunday is Jams for Jake. You all remember the presentation. Um, I'm going to embarrass two employees, but I won't name them. Um, you can't embarrass them. Uh, well, they'll know. <laughs> Believe me, they'll know. Um, we just found out yesterday that our MLD was not able to supply power a week before the event. So two folks in the town have taken it upon themselves, our employees, to on their own time, with their own resources, make sure this works. And, and hats off to our employees who are going in, in well over and above the call of duty for that. And without being asked. And without being asked. And they, I, they only begrudgingly, one of them told me today, he didn't want me to know. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just really a nice thing. And they realize the event and they realize the importance of the event. And they said, how can we not help these kids? So it's just really a nice thing to do. Um, the other thing I wanted to follow up, um, police and fire gave a joint a presentation um, to an emergency management group of 22 or well, 21 other towns recently over in Wakefield. Um, the amount of comments I've got back has dwarfed anything that we've done before. If you remember, some of you went down to the active shooter exercise yes. down at the Danis properties, and thank you again, George Danis. Um, the town has received tremendous accolades from the other communities on doing that. And uh, the important thing is this took four years to get the police and fire on the same page. I'll, uh, I'll quote some of the firefighters. He wants to run where? Into a scene where they're shooting? <laughs> uh, and that's the mission. You know, through all the different active shooter exercises that unfortunately we learn from, um, the faster you get in to rescue victims and to get to medical care, you save lives. Um, to the uh, ratio of 90% you can save instead of 100% that you lose. So the quicker they get in there, the better off it is. So it took the firefighters a little bit of time to understand that the police would protect them as best they can, and it was really very similar in a mission to running into a bur bin bin burning building to save people. You're just running into a different set of danger. So hats off certainly to police and fire. Um, I've gotten comments from a couple mayors and several town managers that they're just really astonished at what Reading was able to pull off. So I just thought that was another good public safety it's something we obviously hope never to use, but it's another example of public safety really making the town very proud. Um, and now, uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, I do want to write or read a memo that I sent to the board yesterday. Before I do, I want to direct your attention to the packet um, tonight, page 9. Uh, there's an additional email referenced. Um, I want to read a short thing, a page and a half I wrote on civil discourse. As a FinCom volunteer for eight years, I was impressed at how effective local government was at doing its business in a nonpartisan way. And it was so different from federal and state governments. I was especially impressed with Reading's town meeting where differing philosophies collided in a very collaborative and collegial manner. And just about everyone in the room knew each other. In the fall of 2005, I joined town government as an assistant town manager and finance director. That night, in the June of 2006, Bill will remember a special town meeting debated whether to join the MWRA or build a new water treatment plant, and that will always stand out to me. Two clear side, uh, sides of thought emerged, each with many seemingly legitimate points. And I should as, add, as finance director, I was completely useless because there was no financial solution to the problem in front of us. Um, there was no clear path. Several uh, debate lasted for hours. Several speakers stood and explained how they came to the meeting with one opinion, but through civil discourse they changed their minds because other members of town meeting spoke so eloquently. Uh, interestingly, this happened on both sides of the issue. The 
final vote to join the MWRA failed to achieve a new needed two-thirds vote as 89 voted yes and 53 voted no, only 63%. The final vote to authorize debt to build a new water treatment plant also failed to get two-thirds vote as only 36% supported it. Town meeting then agreed to reconsider the vote to join the MWRA. Impassioned speakers from the original 53 no votes rose to speak. One after the other, they urged their fellow no voters to change their vote even if they did not change their views. They spoke with a duty, a higher duty to the entire community and have a deep respect despite the fundamental disagreement for their fellow town meeting members that had voted yes. The revised vote, vote passed overwhelmingly by a vote of 113 to 34. I believe this is one of the proudest moments in the history of civil discourse in the town of Reading. Things are quite different today. Mirroring the decline we see nationally, discourse in the town of Reading continues to spiral on a downward slope. Last week I had to refer two incidents of discourse to the police department for investigation. The first was an alleged threat overheard after a public meeting directed towards an employee. The second is attached to your packet and was directed at one appointed board, the elected board of selectmen, and possibly at employees. I have highlighted the sections that have been questioned. <coughs> Over the past two years, the mayors and managers I meet with regularly all lament this path we find ourselves in. We have discussed how our leadership positions are being weaponized by some that seek political gain. We recently debated holding a multi-town local government day and realized it could go horribly wrong given the climate out there, which could lead to even more discord. Recently, I was asked to share some remarks at a community meeting with Reading Embraces Diversity. I attach those remarks for your consideration and highlight one response that I made then and I'll make now. The actions, the local actions last week were not okay. I've also attached recent remarks made by my friend uh, Melrose Mayor Rob Dolan in a radio interview. All his remarks are well re worth reading, but I just want to read one paragraph. Quote, it must be pointed out, however, that there really is no partisan way to pick up the trash or plow snow or plant trees or fix a park or make sure there's enough space in our schools or keep a neighborhood safe. Party affiliation and ideology are a fact and should be celebrated as institutions that have made America stronger. However, they are less important at the local level than the basic principles of good government. And on this we can all agree." Unquote. All town employees strive towards providing a cost-effective good government to the community of Reading. We have always been subject to verbal abuse that few of you would ever tolerate in your lines of work. Over the years, the critics that have entered town hall to speak directly with me usually left with a much better understanding and often with an entirely different view. As town manager, I expect the verbal abuse, although I wish it were all directed at me and not my staff. Recently, this behavior has taken on a, pat a partisan politics tone and surfaced more at public meetings. In about 10 short years in Reading, we have plunged from one of the proudest moments of civil discourse in history of Reading to circumstances that I'm ashamed of. I've always been able to explain to town staff that the proverbial silent majority in town respects their work product as well as their work ethic. Today, my fellow managers and mayors, local leaders, have to call each other once in a while when we learn of events in the community to express similar sentiments to each other for moral support as we lament again the discourse in our respective communities and how it continues to decay. I asked the entire community the question that local leaders have asked each other for the past two years. What are we going to do about it? And specifically, although I don't wish to show it tonight, again, the Board of Selectmen got what the, another appointed board took to be a very serious threat from a member of the community. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. With that, um, so I, I have a question, John? and you know, based on the packet tonight, um, it looks like there was a change of heart. Well, let's put that on the side for a second. Um, we've got a we've got a letter that comes from a volunteer committee member to a staff member, which is pretty incendiary. I, you know, I don't know that you just leave that alone. I don't think that it's appropriate. And I think that I would echo 
to Bob's comments, um, it's been very clear that there's been a change in tone that's going on specifically over the last 12 months um, that is highly inappropriate in a, in a little town like Reading where we're busy, as is pointed out by, I, I thought, a great comment from Mayor Dolan. There's really no partisan way to pick up trash or plow snow. I mean, that paragraph is, I mean, that's true. Um, and so I, I share Bob's concern at the highest level. And when I read that we have one board threatening another board. The one board member. One board member threatening several boards and potentially members of the, of the town staff, um, I think it's inappropriate, um, and I and I don't know that it should go unquestioned, personally. Bob, what happened is after a result of collecting this letter? Let me just also add that I heard directly from one member of the other board that was highly insulted and offended. I, I think I don't like to characterize what people think, but that's really how he came across to me. And I heard of another board member through staff that felt the same way. Um, you know, that board and you were both the direct targets, and then employees were perhaps an indirect target if we agreed with you. Um, in both instances, the police um, visited, uh, you know, both speakers. Uh, in one case, they left a message, and the speaker came down to the police station. I will say that one of the speakers was genuinely horrified and felt misunderstood. When he replayed the whole situation, he totally understood how that conclusion could have been reached, and he clarified what his remarks meant or meant to be. And so the police are thoroughly satisfied there's nothing to see here, and people should just ask, ask act with a little more respect in future meetings. The second issue with the letter and a, and a follow-up letter that you see today that you can characterize any way you want, but there's nothing in there that says apology. No. Um, no. The police also visited, and I got a very first police-like report that basically said they don't believe there's a threat. They, ex they explain their concerns that this is not the way business should be conducted in any place, never mind Reading. And um, they did not believe there was an ongoing threat, but they did not get I did not get any sense that the person who wrote the letter regretted writing any of it or changed their opinion. And that's their right. It is free speech up to a point, up to the points of threats. So I don't believe either is a serious threat. I will tell you, and I feel badly saying this, that there are some boards and committee meetings in which staff has to plan their escape as if there's going to be a threat. They size up the room, they look at the exits, and they say, well, if anything goes wrong tonight, this is how we're leaving. That is where the point we're at now in Reading. That's and to me, that's disgusting. Right. So I don't know what you do about it. I really don't. It's, it's obviously not just a Reading problem. It's a much bigger problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I was at the meeting where I think probably most of these comments took place, at, um, directed at the CPDC, and maybe some of us too. I, you know, I, don't know. I was, I did speak at that meeting. Um, yes, discourse in the <coughs> town is, is um, as people sort of entrench and figure that it's easier to type a couple of things after a cocktail or two on this and think that they're doing civil discourse. Um, and then we have echo chambers where people who agree with that say, nice job, and that gets people dug in even more. And there's people on the other side. I, I think you would look at some of the stuff on here, and 90% of it, people would write, they wouldn't say that if they were looking at you in the eye. Sure. Right? So yeah. I think that's part of it. The other piece of this is that, you know, the, um, and again, I'm not going to apologize for anybody's comments. Um, you know, th there's no ever excuse to be rude or threatening to anybody. But this is a project that is going to be in people's backyards. It's going to impact people profoundly. Um, they are upset. Um, they want to be heard. They don't want to feel that this thing is being railroaded. And, and I don't think that it is. I mean, I think that CPDC has done a great job in terms of working with the developer and doing their job in shaping this project. Um, let's remind folks that um, this could be a whole lot worse if it weren't a 40 R. We could have had you know anybody come through with you know a couple of pickup trucks, buy the land, and put up whatever they want. So, the fact that it's actually being negotiated, I, I think, is a good thing. That said, it's still, I mean, people you know, 
it's their homes. And so the people are going to be a little bit more um, emotional. Uh, they're going to be a little bit more, uh, feel a little bit threatened. And they're going to maybe say things that they may not have said otherwise. Um, so, you know, I, I would sort of maybe look at this, although it's incredibly serious, you know, the fact that the police have to get involved. Let's just sort of understand the context uh, of where this is. And it's probably the context of, of kind of just where we are sort of as a national, you know, as a national thing. So, um, you know, this board has been done a tremendous job in terms of promoting economic development. It's going to impact people more than others. And I think we really need to be sensitive to that while we're doing the right thing for the town of Reading to understand that, you know, there's going to be some things that are going to uh, inconvenience some more than others, um, you know. I'm a big boy, I have thick skin. Um, I'll always say the thing that I believe is right for the town of Reading, but also want to make sure that people have a say and are heard. Um, and I think in this process they have been. So. I think that's fine as far as it relates to difficult conversations. The minute it evolves into a yeah, threat, right. either real or involved, oh, absolutely. it's yeah. over the line. Yeah. And particularly when it comes from not an individual involved in the incident, or in this case the real estate, right. but, but somebody with a effectively a spectator with an opinion, but there are a lot of opinions. Who is a who is a chair of a volunteer committee? That's cool. We're dealing with essentially a, 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 another board in our same organization. That where I, you know, we all say things the following day. We wish we phrased differently. That's kind of part of being a human being, I think. Um, this is over the line, and particularly where it's not coupled with a G. I'm sorry, I said that. It says to me that um, uh, it's it, it's not really resolved. It's still there. It may have been improved and worded differently, but the discontent and the and the uh, the emotions that gave rise to this gave rise to this is still there, and that's a problem. You know, um, Dr. Ornstein, when she spoke at Red, I think I mentioned this a few minutes ago, said two things that gave rise to the original incident of the National Socialists coming to rise with a lack of respect in our fellow man mm -hmm. and the lack of respect in our laws. Well. And I'm not suggesting for the least bit that this is, a, this is related, but there are elements of lack of respect peppered throughout this. I can disagree with you vehemently, but I don't have to attack you, and I don't right. have to besmirch your reputation. We might even be the best of friends, but I can still disagree with you. That's completely missing here. This is a zero-one discussion. I win, you lose. Dan. Uh, having uh, chaired CPDC back in the 80s, I saw many of these somewhat contentious meetings. Uh, there are a couple of facts of life that everybody should realize when they go into these. Number one, just about every one of our business areas, probably without exception, abuts a residential district. So you always have this contention. Secondly, the, uh, the property owner does have a right to develop his or her property within the confines of the law and with the regulation of the CPDC. That's a true fact. Uh, people who don't own that property don't have that inherent right. They certainly have the right to be heard at a hearing. Uh, Bob, what is the current height restriction of business B? Is it something like 40 feet? I, I don't dare guess. I think it starts with a 4. four 40, yeah, so 45, the underlying yeah. zoning in that district, which is business B, would have permitted a 40-foot building years and years ago when business B was enacted. The owners chose not to do that. Six months right. ago, it would have allowed that. Yeah, yeah. before, yeah. right. The owner, and the, it still would have had we done no 40R, so. Everybody should understand those parameters. I know that that's kind of cold hard stuff, but yeah. people, people need to hear it. Andy. John. Um, I, I echo a lot. I mean, Barry said much more eloquently uh, what I wanted to say. That is, this needs to be, I think, viewed in context of um, development, residences, or residents who live nearby, and they, they this is when people are at their most passionate, when they feel their home is being uh, impacted upon. I think, um, I think the, the person did this as a private citizen, so uh, bringing it into the realm of his uh, role on a, a board, we, I'm happy to have a discussion about that. I think we need to acknowledge that he didn't sign it, um, I, I don't think. Um, no, he didn't. That's from, from his right. board. The, the other the other thing is um, you know he I, I it's in I have to say he he used the tar and feather term which which is um, 
you know, if this was 100 years ago or 200 years ago, I would be sort of uh, listening to my neck and looking for the escape yeah. exits. Um, I think now it can be often used as uh, an expression of uh, displeasure with, with government officials. That said, I think uh, people have to realize how they choose their words and what their, how the words can be, be uh, received. And then I would also say that we've, you know, all of us at times have, have lost our cool, especially when it's something we're very emotional about and have hit, and typed out something and hit the send button uh, too fast. I think it's worthwhile reaching out to this, somebody reaching out to this individual and saying, this goes too far and here's why. I think this the Reading Police happened. delivered that message very nicely. Yeah. Okay. And just to be clear, the reason I had to call the police is I got two complaints from people affected, not yeah. me, yeah. that said, I am afraid you need to do something, and I am obligated by law to do something right. about mm -hmm. that. If it was just directed at me, I would have picked up the phone and called them, and certainly not involved the police. But at some point, you have no choice, when, especially when a, no. a volunteer, or, or in both cases, a volunteer reported the incidents. Under, understood. I, I'm, I think that sometimes... And I don't know this individual. I, maybe, I don't either. Maybe one of you do. I don't think he lives in the area. Um, I don't know. But uh, I, mean, I think over in the Gold, Gold Street area. I, I don't know yeah, where no, he lives. I, but, uh, I think, somewhere else. Okay. I think um, sometimes people need to hear. I, I certainly do. People need to hear a message more than one time. Um, and well, hopefully he's hearing it tonight. So hopefully. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is, uh, this is Jeremy. John. All right. Were you finished, Andy? Yeah. Thanks. So um, I do understand and clearly support the fact that when somebody's home feels encroached on and there's a public process, that people that partake of that public process should be entitled to do so. Um, it sounds like it got a little bit amped up, and it sounds like there was a discussion with you know a person involved in that public setting and it sounds like that person was kind of horrified at how it sounded to someone else and to your point um, people sometimes say and do things and look we do have a right to talk about things and we certainly do have a right especially in the public setting to be able to speak our mind about our where we live you know, I mean, if something's going on across my back fence, naturally I'm going to be interested and probably a little noisier than I normally would be about, you know, one that was across town. I, I get that. So what I'm going to say next has nothing to do with my support of that and that the people who live there um, have every right to be very concerned and want to have a dialogue. Um, as Board of Selectmen, we have an obligation to either support the town manager in his duties and tasks throughout the town and among his staff. So we either support him or we tell him go away. I mean, that's if we cut through the noise. That's our that's our charge and our obligation. Um, I think Bob has raised a very important point. We. We have not just a private citizen, although this is a letter signed by a person um, not indicating membership in a board or the fact that they're a chair. Um, but that doesn't make it go away. I mean, we have obligations as a board of selectmen to support Bob's efforts to take care of his staff. This went to a staff member, and it has a very threatening tone and it's highly inappropriate and it I guess leads to what Bob has talked about is the fact that he has in this environment has staff members who are looking for the exit when they walk into a meeting that they're assigned to go do and, and by the way just to clarify that's not CPDC that's an entirely unrelated board yes I and I know that to be true okay. so I mean the fact that that's going on is unthinkable in my opinion. No, it did, it did. We do have an obligation to oversee those boards, commissions, and committees that we appoint. And when someone agrees to raise their hand in the next room in front of the town clerk, 
you can't subrogate your obligations to that pledge um, based on how you sign a letter. You've got a certain, you know, this is town business. So if anything, their standard is even higher, in my opinion. Uh, that's what I you think, too. And I town, think that you know. I think that this kit doesn't just go away. I think, and I'm not suggesting some awful punitive, you know, I'm suggesting, you know, maybe in a more official way, something that you mentioned, uh, Andy. Uh, this person needs to be talked to. I mean, there's a certain reporting mechanism to this board. And we have obligations to people involved in this board to be sure that this, if this is the way somebody wants to behave, they shouldn't behave as an employee of the town, which all of us are, whether we're volunteers or paid, um, we're de facto employees of the town. So let's like write a letter to the person. And That's what I think. Describe that, um, why we're unhappy and what our expectations Well, I'm are. unhappy. I don't know if the rest of you are, but How can anybody not be unhappy about right. that? Uh, Andy? Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, as you know, I work for the state, and, and I don't, and sometimes I receive letters that are, uh, let's say, not very flattering about um, some work that I've been involved with. And um, the way the head of our um, bureau in the regional office handles it is first he always calls me in and says, I'm sorry you received this letter, Andy. Um, and then he often calls the person who sent the letter and, and, and explains, uh, how, that, that this is not okay. That speaking to, you know, one of my employees or, or writing a letter to one of my employees of this fashion isn't okay and here's why. Um, and usually that's a pretty, it's an informal means, it's a phone call, um, but, but it's a way of backing up the employee and um, it's a way of getting the message across to um, the person who sends the email, writes the letter. Yeah, I, I prefer the more straightforward, straight read of it, which is this is really no way to to address a member of town, yes, and you got to back up our town manager. I wouldn't be trying to um, read this with a critical eye. I would read it as it was written, and this is thoroughly unacceptable. And that gets communicated not by a phone call; it gets communicated by, by the Reading Police. And I presume if there's a second incident, it's now a pattern. So um, I'm embarrassed. I, I'm embarrassed there isn't an apology attached to this that says, "Look, I did a silly thing. Please excuse it." Here's, the, here's a more formalized letter. That doesn't take anything to do. It doesn't diminish the individual. It actually makes them redeem themselves. It says, look, I made a mistake. I recognize it. I'm, uh, there's none of that evidence in the, in the follow-up letter at all. I, I don't want to dwell on this because we've got a full agenda tonight. But um, I would support the recommendation that we send a note from the Board of Selectmen. I'm happy to pen something, send it around, take inputs, and send a joint, send a joint note with all of our signatures. Okay. Just make sure you send it through me so we don't yes. break yeah. any rules. Of course. Of course. Thank you. All right. With that, we'll move to the first discussion item, which is change of managers at Chili's. Yeah, I don't is there anyone here tonight? No, I don't think there's anyone here. Um, you've seen the police report. This yeah. is a simple thing. There's no objection. Right. Right. <coughs> okay. We have a, a motion. Do we have motions? Yes. Yeah. Second um, page. Yeah. Oh, on the back. <laughs> I won't place it. Okay, uh, move the Board of Selectmen approve the change of manager for an annual all alcoholic beverage beverages restaurant license, Pepper Dining Inc., doing business as Chili's at 70 Walker's Brook Drive, Reading, Massachusetts. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Barry seconds the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. 5 0. Sharon. Yes, it's great. Okay. So I thought I'd start out by just doing a quick review of the results of fiscal 17 and the reserves that we have as a result, um, where some of the words like him were not at finance forum. So the first slide here that you see is our fiscal 17 revenues that came in 1.3 million um, 
over our projections and the uh, contributing factors, which again, motor vehicle excise somehow seems to keep um, going up. Um, and then we have some items there that are starred. Um, and those items are starred because we're kind of referring to them as one-time payments because they're not expected to happen every year. Um, and so we kind of broke it down in between what could be sustainable and what could be just a one-time thing. So for instance, investment income, um, that is over um, projection by $244,000, um, largely attributable to the fact that we're holding a lot of capital money um, that we never project the interest on because it's, you know, it's kind of going to make an up blip and then it will go back down. So that's what we consider a one-time thing. Delinquent taxes were already part of a, 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 a prior year um, tax base, so we can't budget for those. The FEMA storm reimbursement was a storm that happened in 2014. <laughs> So we couldn't know that that money was coming, so we couldn't plan for it. So those sorts of things are always happening in our favor, which is lovely. Um, but it's always, you know, a fair amount of it is stuff that we haven't budgeted for because we don't know it's going to happen for sure. Under the miscellaneous category, there's actually um, about 77000 of it is actually um, Maya rewards and dividends that we get. We get them every year, varying amounts not guaranteed, so we never budget for it. Um, so that's almost always a little buffer that we always have in there. Quick uh, question. So <coughs> on the vehicle excise tax, uh, this year, Bob, you're at 3.38 million growing. Looks like a 250 a year, 150 a year, something like that. So FY. We had actually talked about um, revisiting our fiscal right. 18 budget and increasing it up to be closer to actuals. I wonder so if we could make up, right, that's a lot, right? Yeah. So we had uh, talked about doing that at November town meeting. Okay. At least 50,000, if not 100,000, increase our current okay. projection. Yeah, John, whatever I sent you yesterday is the number we both agreed on. I just right. don't remember what it was. Right. Correct. I think but it was 50 that you might have agreed Another 50, yeah, yeah, since the financial plan. Since the finance plan. And Sharon, do you remember, I mean, you know, it's hard, but in last year, the year before, was this overage on par? Yeah, it was about the same. It was one of the big year. Yeah, you'll see another okay. slide that will show you a history of what we had for turn back on the revenue <coughs> projection and expenses right. under. So the other ones are probably, too, it's such a small turn back that it's hard to bet that you could you could uh, raise the bar at all safely, mm -hmm. right? You know, one of the <coughs> sneaky things that I, I wasn't paying enough attention to is there's a lot more people in town, there's a lot more cars in town. Mm -hmm. That's some of this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, gee, everyone bought a new car this year. Well, they More won't household. do it next year. Yeah, we, this is we, new households. We've realized that those developments that we brought in brought in a lot of new cars, yeah. and other cars that weren't part of our base before. So. But then, you know, if, if you look, Sharon, on the second page, you know, we kind of do the free cash analysis over the last five years. Mm -hmm. We've been pretty consistent within a really narrow band of revenue over budget from a low mm -hmm. of 1.13 to a high of 1.83. So um, every year it's all different things. Mm -hmm. But it's still, you know, you can but count on. But when you're on doing a balanced budget, you do not want to be budgeting for revenues that you're not sure on. No, but but you can see some of the trends, and then well, you we, can, it definitely it, feels yeah. like we always have at least a million dollars uh -huh. there that we're not expecting to come. Yeah. And that's to me, that's the basis for FinCom using a million two or whatever it is in free cash, because you can't plan not to spend money that you're approved right. to spend. Right. You have to have a reason for the revenues are there, and this is, to me, the reason. It almost always ends up that what we end up regenerating makes up for what we're spending in free cash. Almost it's like we didn't use free cash, right. honestly. It almost works but out the, that way. But the best explanation is conservative budgeting leads to, generally, some, somewhere in the order of a million mm -hmm. um, of revenue over budget, right? And DOR would recommend that we do it the Correct. way we and do it. Correct, and that's a good thing. they don't want you to right. have revenue deficits. And also and expenses to back you know, that, that are lower than what you expect. Although that's undesirable. That's hard to Yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely sometimes where some line items we have a budget and it's under, but then you get this unexpected revenue help. Right. So, um, so I'll go back to the other slide that we were okay. just on. So this is the expenditures. 1.66 million under budget. How come it keeps moving on? Um, shrink that just a little. Just a little bit. There, that helps. Um, and so these are the culprits that led to us having this under budget. So you see that we had some capital, employee benefits. We tend to be a little high on employee benefits sometimes because um, we are budgeting it so far in advance and we don't know what our enrollment's going to look like. Um, school salaries, they have turnover, vacancies, unpaid leave of absences. So they have some savings related to open positions just like we do. Um, then they have the out-of-district special ed, which is an accommodated cost. Um, 
and that just came in lower than expected, and then various accounts within their um, school um, budget that came in. That 93 is small accounts. No, it wasn't in our 90, packet. That page. No, it's missing a page in the packet. And the town salaries, that 478 you see there, that includes money that we asked at the end of, um, I want to say it was in June when Bob was out. Um, we had asked the Board of Selectmen and FinCom to get together um, to vote some FinCom reserves in excess of the 150 for fire department. But the fire department is part of the public safety um, vote that we do at town meeting. So it's actually um, police and fire are counted as one when it comes down to it because they're voted as one. Their salaries and expenses are voted as one. So it turned out we actually had savings on the police side that actually made it so that most of the money that they asked for was turned back as part of this 478. So we really didn't need all that money, but it was a conservative. When a department head like Greg is looking at his budget, he's not seeing what the police might have savings, and so he's being conservative. He knows he's overrun, but the police had savings that would have netted it out. You had a line that had, could have overrun, which is why you allocated money. You can't move it around in the budget. You have to do I it can move way. it around between public safety, right. but the two department heads would have to agree right. to it. Within so, public safety. Yeah, but yes, because it's voted as public safety right. salaries, public yeah. safety expenses. So that includes police and fire. And that was just done at the end of the fiscal year, so yeah. it, over time. it was kind yeah, of but, a... But the, the two department heads don't know what the other one has, and they're not going to count on the other one having access for them. Um, and at the time, Mark wasn't sure exactly what he had going on. Um, he did have some openings okay. during the year. He knew he had some savings, but he didn't know he had enough to compensate for what Greg was saying he was going to have as a shortfall. Uh, I might, um, FinCom recently met and we discussed whether to change the way uh, they meet at the end of the year to the middle of July when there's a lot more certainty. Um, and they concluded that things are fine the way they are. They understood that, you know, when you're running a $5 million organization like fire or police, $10 million combined, uh, one week at the end of the year of significant overtime is a big number. Yeah. Um, you know, if we had that fire, um, the schoolhouse fire, the last week of the year, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there has to be some kind of cushion at the That's end of the year. And I don't want to be building a cushion in just in case and then laying and people to off to have yeah. that cushion. So it's a question of, you know, a philosophical discussion with FinCom that we had is, um, you know, do you want to just always be in a position to give this money out, or do you want to wait till July when we really know? And they're comfortable with, with the way it went. If you wait until July, that's the beginning of the new fiscal year. Well, right? we have to they can meet through, year like, year yeah, the middle of July to fix the prior year mm -hmm. when all the receipts would so be you have known, two the costs would be known. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can get your arms around what you need. Because yeah. I don't remember the number, but half of that, maybe not quite half of that 480000 was just money asked for at the end of June and not needed. Yeah, it was so, like 175 that we asked. For. What's the biggest cushion you think you'd ever need in terms? You know, is is that kind of the high high water limit? In terms of what we turned back. Well, no, what fire no, and safety might come with you at the end of the year and say, uh, it's over 100,000 each. Yeah. Uh, no, probably not each. Maybe 150 combined. Oh, you mean something for like police that? and fire? Yeah, like yeah I'm thinking of the highest some. over um, over times I've ever seen. 100,000 at the. Those minimum, are actual. I would say. Those are actual numbers. But their, their ask could be bigger than that since they don't necessarily. Well, if, if we're sitting here in the second to last week of June, we'd ask for the next two weeks, if they're really bad, what's the worst they could be? Okay. That mm -hmm. kind of number. Dan? Well, uh, just thinking of a devil's advocate issue here. Uh, so we, we were over on revenues, under on budget, to the tune of almost $3 million. So a casual observer might make the observation that we don't need an override. I, I think it's, it's very important yeah. to message that uh, yeah. properly. Well, I mean, but those, when it's a lot of salaries, you have to see right. how much pain caused that, you know, because we were suffering just, for those. It's kind of a sticky yeah. note for us to <laughs> we message We really that. needed yeah. those people, but for a period of time, we didn't have them. Um, and I don't think that they, that means that that money wasn't needed. It was. We right. just never know when that sort of thing is going to happen. Yeah. It right. takes a long time, particularly in public safety, to fill any role. Um, and so they could be without somebody for six months to a year. You, know, you just don't know when you're building this budget what challenges you're going to have of this nature. It's also safe to say that along these lines that it's been our habit, and I say our, not meaning the Board of Selectmen, but um, town manager and, and the chiefs, jobs are not created on my experience on the town side for the last you know four or five years that I've been very closely associated. We don't create jobs that we don't see sustainable opportunities to go forward. That's right. So when you, you know, the other side of, the, of, of your point, Dan, mm -hmm. is 
yes, one might argue that, well, let's see, you you got more revenue in than you thought you were going to get, and now you realize that some of that may be ongoing, excise tax, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. um, and you didn't, uh, and your expenses were lower. Well, they were lower because, in my opinion, we didn't fill jobs because we saw no clear path to sustain those. Right. Am I wrong about that, Bob? Isn't no, that been you're, your habit? You're right. And, and you know, last year when we had the run-up to the override discussion, what would you do if you didn't get one? I'm not going to remember every position I mentioned, but all but one of them I did eliminate that I mentioned. And the one I did not eliminate was a seasonal worker in DPW, where this summer we knew that because of another vacancy that we still haven't been able to fill, we had enough money to hire someone for the summer. So, you know, I'm going to an excruciating level of detail of showing we don't usually spend money that we haven't previously got authorization from town meeting. But in this case, I felt that DPW has wage money, there's a vacancy, we can hire someone for the summer to do work, let's do it. But that's unusual. Well, the other thing we need to look at is how come we can't fill some of these positions? Right? So issue. that looks at kind of the And should we broader be? We should probably be filling. I, not, yeah. I don't think there's any question that some of these positions should be filled. Mary. That looks at sort of. Sometimes you know. we just can't get anybody to accept an offer. I mean, sometimes it's, it's simple as yeah. that. It's not that we're not trying to fill them. Right. Sometimes. It's well, that's what I mean. Is it why, why well, some we are and some we aren't. And I mean, we've Sharon's point, and, and FinCom's had a pretty thorough presentation. You've had a shorter one. You can always have a long one. Or to hire police and fire is very slow. Right. So even if we get six months' notice that a police officer is going to retire. It takes way more than six months yeah, to hire a the, the academy. You have get, to go through the academy. You have to have an exam if you didn't already have one. They have to then have three to six months of training before they can count, if you will, on the street. So <coughs> even though police is out of civil service and we've cut the time significantly, it's still, it's it's still, still a year, yeah. easily. And fire, it's a year and a half. So you plan the best you can. And on the town side, we're building this bottom up. We're building it based on who's in the position right now, what do they make, what is the planned increase, if any. and and that's the way it works. We're not taking what we had last year and just increasing it by a percentage. We're actually building it person Bottoms by up. person. And, and I think that's the charge that we heard from the voters. Yeah. Demonstrate how you're spending the money and demonstrate why you're spending the money. And but we're also not just spending it because it's there. Um, precisely. Which it's is not needed, it goes back. It's, it's not it's typical it's government spend. Right. Which is spend all. it by June 30th or else I'm not going to get the same amount. Yeah, I mean, exactly. it's not the way we operate this yeah. time. Exactly. I mean, that in and of itself should give people, wow, that's... This is actually good news to have some building of it reserves, is. but in this climate, it's, it's kind so of Barry, a mixed talked, message that it's been. We sent. talked earlier about the narratives that related to the survey. You, you could imagine one um, response might be, gee, the town's swimming in dough. They don't need to even talk about it overhead. That isn't the right conclusion. Right. And that's where, frankly, a, a narrative to cover this is also needed, right? Andy. John, I think maybe in the next slide, um, mm -hmm. I can I can chime in. The, I think it the five year free ca free cash analysis is that ah, there you go. Okay, thank you. So this is just something that Fincom had asked for. They they seem to like to see some history of what our free cash looks like and what our uses look like. So this is basically how free cash is calculated. We have a certified number at the beginning of the year, and you'll notice that fiscal 17 is not certified yet. This is just my calculation. But we start the year with what DOR has certified. And then you have um, what I've shown you, revenues over budget um, and then expenses under budget. That's regeneration being you know, generated in the current year. And then we have what we used for free cash since the last time it was certified. So when we go to an April town meeting and we're voting money to be used for the subsequent year, it comes out as soon as we vote it. So it's included in that number. Anything that we used at November town meeting, that's going to be in that number. So. You can see in fiscal 17, the number looks enormous, but we had the 2.2 million for the settlement. I mean, we were really in good shape that it only went down 700,000 for the amount of money that we actually spent in the year. Um, so, and then that other adjustments is really prior year money coming forward that got turned back. So if, if at the end of the year there's what they call a purchase order or encumbrance um, from a prior year, the money gets brought forward um, because they know at the end of the year this transaction isn't complete. We know we purchased something that we don't have the bill for it or whatever the case might be. If a purchase order is closed from a prior year and it has money on it, it goes back to free cash. The system knows not to let anybody spend it because you're not supposed to come in with the years. All that would be captured under that other adjustment to free cash. But also something that people aren't familiar with is that 
um, if any funds, like a grant, is actually ending the year in a deficit, I actually have to deduct it from free cash. It's almost as if they borrowed the money from the general fund. And it's not uncommon because most grants are reimbursement type grants. So we spend the money, they reimburse us. But what happens is we don't have to deduct it if we get the money by September 30th, which is why I hesitate to give you a number prior to September 30th because it would be a much lower number than what it ends up actually being. Because if we get that money in and can prove it to DOR that it came in by September 30th, we do not deduct it. Out. But that would be where you'd see it on that adjustment line. But we are about where we were in fiscal 14, even after using that obnoxious amount of free cash, um, <laughs> which I thought was going to be so much lower. So I was very surprised. Very. So th this kind of begs the question a, a, a little bit. So, um, and I think maybe Sharon, your next slide um, mm -hmm. t talks about what we actually have in free cash. Mm -hmm. And I think in turn, you know, according to this, we have over $10 million of free cash. Yeah, so the next someone, slide shows you the... So someone reserve. might think... It's not free cash, it's it, some of it's stabilization. Reserve. Right, some of it's but free it's, cash. Our, it's our reserve. reserves. yeah. And I think that we have to do a better job of defining free cash. So if someone looks at this and says, $10 million, why, do you, why, why, do you, why, do you, why are you asking me for more? And I think that we, we use free cash... I mean, people, people might define free cash in a lot of different ways. I think most people would look at free cash and would say, Those are your, that is your rainy day fund. That is mm -hmm. your reserves. That is the stuff that... You put away for when times get hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we looked at um, FinCom's policy, right, um, of 7% minimum reserves based on what we're, uh, uh, you know, a $92 million budget, that, that should mean that we should have $6.5 million of a rainy day fund. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and Paula Perry brought this up at the, fin, at the financial right. forum, and I think right. it's a tremendously uh, smart idea. If that's the case, then we should take six and a half million dollars and put that in, into what our stabilization fund is. That's the money that goes in, but takes a lot to get out. It's two things right? to get it out. Yeah. Now, the other thing that we use free cash for, if you go back to the other slide, is if anybody runs a hundred million dollar business, um, cash that's flows are uneven, right? You have a working line of capital, right? That's essentially what we do. We, we use free cash, basically when revenue comes in or expenses are lower, we pay it back, and so we have anywhere from, you know, a two million to a four million dollar working line of capital. Anybody who runs a business understands that um, that's not necessarily free cash. That's money that we're essentially borrowing from ourselves at zero interest mm -hmm. to run the enterprise. And then at the end of the day, if there's more in there, we can throw it into the stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. So, what it really says, what people should really understand is, is that there's not ten million dollars of reserves. There's really six, mm -hmm. right, on our policy. Yeah. And the rest of it we use to kind of balance out the operations. And I think that's an important point to make. And I know it's not ours to make, it's FinCom's to actually make. But I think um, as far as, you know, being transparent about sort of, you know, what do we have in free cash, what do we have in reserves? Yes, it's 10 million. But, you know, some of that we use as a way to kind of even out operations. And the other part we're using as a rainy day, which is really what mm -hmm. I think in people's mind, if you ask 10 people what they think free cash means, I think nine and a half would say. Just the name itself is pretty much. Right. So people, <laughs> it, people would say. It's free. It's, free our, cash, it's our rainy day. Yeah. They would say, oh, that's your rainy day fund, right? Yeah. But we're using it for both ways. And I think that that's an important distinction to make. A lot of people have looked at it by, its, by the nomenclature, and they think it's the mad money. Free cash. Right. Oh, that's that you're going to spend to kind of make up. That's the other thing that you right. have to clarify. But we're always, we're, we're using it, and we're paying it back, so to speak, when we have returns or yeah, when we don't yeah. spend as much. And it's it and it's, it's, it's a smart way of doing business. business. Well, you know, Barry, you've correctly identified how the money works. That I mean, that's clear. The problem is communicating that. Yeah. And I think the limitations that are put on Sharon have to do with the nomenclature. Right. I mean, they've got to, it's got to sit a certain way as it's reported. And that's a problem. And then FinCom maybe could, you know, I mean, obviously, I, I think that's their job. I'm just sort of making a suggestion that they can look at this because that, that's, a, that's a, I think that people would get an aha moment if they realize that, oh, you don't really have $10 million in reserves. I mean, um, mm -hmm. because of the other way of doing it, if we put everything into a stabilization fund, um, then we'd, you know, and, and we had nothing to kind of balance things out. It'd be brutal. We'd, well, we would have to be pitch perfect on our budget. Right. You know, understandably, you know, more people have a regular paycheck than they do run a small business um, or a medium-sized business. And 
when you're running the business, you aptly point out, and you know whether we want to admit it or not, we are running the, you know, a, the business of government here. You've got to have, million dollar, uh, yeah, that it's not small. I mean, you know, you've got to have that money that's available to smooth things out. The average person doesn't understand, doesn't right. intuitively. It's not that they wouldn't understand it. Of course, if it's explained, they will understand it. But intuitively, they don't think about that because their paychecks are 52 or 12 or 26, whatever that flow is, and they plan their expenses. Obviously, ours are irregular. Um, we don't, you know, we have some predictability, but you've got to have that backflow. And I, I, I do think, Sharon, you're, you're putting it into a tough spot because of the way that you're required to show it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to be prepared over the course of the next six months to speak clearly, um, not on behalf of FinCom, they're going to be doing what they do, of course, but we're going to be asked questions because ultimately the questions get asked of the select. Remember the, the admonition in many of the question 13 comments, um, communicate, communicate, communicate. And this is one of those things. Um, Bob, I, what's the, what is the typical free cash percentage of most of our peers? Isn't it closer to 10? Um, I was going to address that. Four or five years ago, we sat down with FinCom um, and started talking about peer communities and different ways to approach this. And you know, to some degree, some of this is finance and some of this is marketing, and there's kind of a blurry line. Um, most of our peer communities have a capital stabilization fund. We have not. We have a general stabilization fund that had, I believe, a one-time deposit, and otherwise no one ever thinks about it. Um, a capital stabilization fund is typically 3 to 5 percent of an annual operating budget. And if you think of things that could go wrong in Reading, I'll be knocking on all kinds of work <laughs> here. Um, typically, a capital item would be the biggest single expenditure you'd have if something went wrong. Um, it's a little easier to imagine that in water and sewer, but the same is with the general fund. Are you going to have a personnel emergency that costs you $2 million? I don't think so. So a lot of communities use a capital stabilization fund, and then if we had one, obviously our free cash would be smaller. And then on top of that, many of them, but sure. not as many, have a general stabilization fund. So the actual and is that amount, what they kind of call their rainy day fund? Yes. Sort of? yes. The general so, stabilization fund right. is kind of you described it as working capital. Maybe that's not a bad way to look at it. Um, the, co the combination of all the things they have versus our single way of looking at it, if you will, is um, we're right in the line of peers. They're all 10 to 12 percent. Some of them are higher. I was really surprised when I found out communities that I would not consider wealthy, that I would not consider in financially good shape, had very good bank accounts. But they had that for a reason. If something goes wrong, they have no choice. They have to fix it. It has to be done. Um, so the combination of a capital stabilization fund, a general stabilization fund, and real free cash um, was almost always over 10 percent, as we are. We're 11. I was kind of embarrassed because I thought we were doing better than they were, and we're really not. We're really just in the line. And I agree with you, the optics of free cash makes it more of a target. It's like, oh, that's something you can do anything with you want, you want with. It, it should be put in buckets. And, and to FinCom's credit, at their last meeting, as, as Paula mentioned, I think they're a little more sanguine to the idea that this free cash could have different purposes and thus should perhaps go in a bucket. Whereas a prior FinCom was concerned that if you put it in a capital stabilization fund, it takes a two-thirds vote at town meeting to get it out, whereas free cash is majority. I was like, you know, if it's a crisis, I hope we could prove yeah, the right. town meeting that two-thirds yeah. wouldn't yeah. be a yeah, problem. Exactly. So there's no material. Putting it into various bins doesn't, because of the two-thirds <coughs> versus half, make it any diff more difficult or, more, or more, more routine to get it out. It's, it's the same process. I, I, would, I would say the bond rating agencies would look at it identically. If anything, they might slightly prefer the two-thirds mm -hmm. thing as a more secure uh, source of funding. More, yeah. I would. All right. And I think the community would too. It's like, okay, you're not going to, because yeah. there's other things. Okay, we can throw a couple hundred thousand at overtime or mm -hmm. whatever, but, but that's really our working capital. It's not yeah. our spending of reserves. This is at and the moment like the mayonnaise jar. At the, right? And everything is in it. Our right? town, manage, uh, town meeting members have to agree on taking it out of there. Right. You know, that's a harder that's a harder thing to do. So, Andy, yeah, um, Sharon, I, to just ask you a question about this, so I can wrap my head around it, and maybe people at home can wrap their head around it as well. Um, is it is the is it analogous to? Uh, someone's household budget 
in, in that free cash isn't, isn't really f free. It may be cash, but it's not free. It's sort of like a, a savings account that as you go in, and you have expenses that you predicted for the upcoming year, you know, your car service, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a new car, uh, et cetera. Um, and, but you, you never can predict those really super well. So you have a savings account that you mm -hmm. dip into at various parts of the year when you have to have a plumber come over and mm -hmm. fix something. And, and then when, you know, you have a month, a good month or two, you put back into the savings account. And mm -hmm. so... That's exactly what's happening. The, 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 when, I, when I saw this, I think people will quickly jump on the book. You had a, as Dan said, almost a $3 million <coughs> surplus. But, well, we really didn't. We, we, we actually uh, dipped into free cash by about one and a half million, it looks right. like. And for a budget of 100, uh, close to 100 million, um, I Small think that's understandable. Yeah. <laughs> so is the household analogy uh, I think it's definitely, up and I mean, because our, our surprises are to scale of the size of our budget. I mean, household emergencies are going to be smaller than an emergency that we might have to suffer and have to dip into our emergency fund for, so it's all kind of relative. Thanks. So as far as that goes, I think we did go to the next slide and just showed you that we are at just under $10.3 million, just about 11% of our revenues, and we are in excess of our 7 million, our 7% minimum policy. So that was just a quick overview for those of you who did not get to see it at finance forum. And Bob, so if we wanted to boost the general stabilization fund, that would be a, a vote of a two thirds vote of town meeting. An article of town meeting, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's too late for November, obviously. Yeah. But maybe, well, maybe a time when we do the budget. That's a perfect time for it. Just yeah. um, right, right. The structure's already there. We to fill it up. So then I just figured I would give you just kind of an overview of kind of what I'm working on currently. I've calculated free cash. We're in the process of getting DUR to certify it. That's the process. Sometimes we're waiting in line for our turn to be certified. Um, our audit has been started, although Melanson and Heath have lost a lot of auditors, so I feel like we've been kind of pushed out a little bit, but they're working from their office and doing, uh, you know, working on our audit as they can. They did come out in September. They're not done yet but we're still providing information as it's being requested. Um, we are working on the tax recap, the tax re setting process is of the utmost priority, and so we're, we're beginning that process now. And then the Schedule A is the last thing I need to wrap up the reporting, which is a DOR reporting, where it just kind of gives us all kinds of financial analysis numbers that they post up on their website to compare communities. Um, so that's being done right now. Last time we spoke, I apologize, but I believe John Urbina had asked me for the legal numbers for how much we spent on the litigation so that you're knowledgeable <coughs> about how much was really spent. At the time, I thought I had a spreadsheet that was up to date, and then I realized that the last time Gail and I had up to, updated it was September of last year, of fiscal 17. So I needed to take the time to update the spreadsheet to give you the most up to date numbers. So this is actually through. Um, Fiscal 18, there was a small bill that we paid um, to KMP um, in fiscal 18. So at this point, we're just under $859,000 for legal costs for that settlement. Water under the bridge, nothing that we can do about it, but wow. Um, and it breaks it down for attorney fees, testimony, some miscellaneous costs that we paid for DVDs, court costs, and the master judge. And I can certainly update this if anything else it should come in. But the one thing that we are still looking for from KMP um, is a breakdown of uh, the legal cost attributable to items that we were um, on the positive end of. Right. Because we can actually get. Did you say that again? So we are looking for KMP to give us a breakdown of how much of our legal cost we paid towards um, items that were a positive outcome in our direction. because. MSBA might reimburse they them. They may reimburse that. And so that's holding up our final reimbursement because they, they only want one more reimbursement for us. They there's want to certain, wrap up. There's the a certain deal. irony there. So we're know. waiting for KMP <laughs> to do this work, and I don't know if they're going to charge yeah. us anything for digging in and trying to figure out. I mean, out. Are we talking, we're not talking about a huge amount of money because no. there wasn't a lot that was yeah. positive on our end, right? I, mean, I don't really well, they, know. Well, it was they several hundred thousand money dollars. to begin with in addition to whatever legal money they might give us. I mean, MSBA owes us money um, from the last reimbursement because they held on to it because they knew that we, were, we felt we were close to a settlement at the time, so they've had it for over a year. And then the final settlement 
has to be submitted, but they said do do one last reimbursement, include the last <coughs> reimbursements if you can. Um, and so I'm still waiting for King P to provide that. So I don't know if there's any cost associated with them. I would think there would be. Taking that time, it's really There'll be a cost for anything yeah. that they do. And so this, this number could change, but I'm Leave not it. thinking it would be greatly. I, then I just don't know. Um, but so this is pretty much all the cost. So uh, relative to that, um, do we have all of their, do we have all their bills now, finally? Through everything that happened up to the settlement. Okay, think, separate, yes. f through the settlement. But not this, what they're doing Not this thing that you're yeah. asking them yeah, to do. Yeah, I don't think I've okay. gotten those for that. And so the second part of that question is, have we paid that in full? Their bills? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Um, lastly, um, what will we use for leverage to get the last piece that we need? I, I mean, know. what do I mean? Uh, Ray because I, trying I, mean, to help us. I mentioned <laughs> earlier that I had got a call from Ray Miaris and one thing, and this was the second topic, is he wanted to talk about, you know, frankly, their lack of compliance to our request from last spring. It's just, it is what it is. This isn't, this isn't like we asked a week ago. No. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this stretches back to a time uh, prior to April 4th when I was chairman mm -hmm. of this board. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's how far back this goes. They. There's got to be somewhere we can go. Obviously, we can't do it with the checkbook because we've already paid them. All um, right. So, okay, well, and I understand we pay our bills when they come in and as we should. Yeah. Um, there's got to be a compliance unit or of our association, um, <coughs> ethics committee, that we need, we need to follow. They need to be accountable for this. If there's a cost of doing business to get the information, yeah. fine, but there's a lot of money waiting for reimbursement. In a relative way, a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, I'm imagining it is, it's over a million dollars. Yeah, I know it's. I know it's not small. Yeah, I, I think it's personally what I would pursue. I don't. I'm not a lawyer. I don't pretend. Uh, I'd like to find another avenue to close this loop, not using them. If we can do it, if Ray Miars can do the work and yep. swear for it, do his best effort. <coughs> Based on I'm the, good with the that. details of But I don't know that that's legal. Yeah. yeah. I, well, I, you, I don't know. It seems like you'd almost have to have access to their files in order and to be able to do we that. We have seen a lot of it, but it's up to Ray to. I don't know if he's comfortable with that. <coughs> I can't speak for him. Do you know what order of magnitude we're likely talking about? What, what percentage of that 388 is likely to be attributable to claims where we prevailed? It's likely to be, first of all, very small. I'll be I'll be really really optimistic and say twenty five percent. Okay. Oh, that's actually more than I thought. I think that you said really really optimistic. Yeah. I would have picked that. So happened. this is not one of the things where we we we, we decline to send bills to people because what mm -hmm. we're going to get costs less than the stamps. So. Right. Okay. That's not the situation. No. But the only reason to get that estimate is to submit to MSBCA to, to reimburse get, to get the rest. Of the so you know what the irony is here? We held up this whole process to finally get it settled and now we're holding up the reimbursement because we're trying to get something settled. There's a real irony there. Yeah. And, well, there's, you know, there's a cast of circular logic that goes on around this entire thing, including, you know, $858,000 in legal fees that have emanated from a weak attempt to not pay $2.3 million. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of ways to look at this, um, and you know, you got an eight hundred fifty-eight thousand dollar legal bill that's on top of a six million dollar settlement that was begat from a question about two point three million dollars worth of expense. Mm -hmm. I, the pretzel logic here defies, you know, rational imagination. Is there any, uh, on the 460 that came out of the construction project, would, 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 is there any question about the, um, um, is that an appropriate use of those funds? Or is that, is that also a question? In terms of it being charged there, I yeah. think at the time they believed it was appropriate yeah, it because okay. we are being reimbursed by the MSBA. Did, we have that agreement with the MSBA. It was part of the that, project. That if there was any legal fees that we had positive outcomes that they would be reimbursing a piece. So that was a way to capture them all in that one okay. spot. So to me it didn't highlight as odd, but I didn't know how weak of a case we had. I didn't know <coughs> much about what was really going on not being here when it all started. So Sharon, on this though, I mean there's 850 some odd thousand dollars, uh, but it's broken down part that was paid out of the, the project and then paid by the town. Paid by the town is about four hundred thousand. So, is that 
is that the cost of what John was just talking about? Of or yeah, answer that first. I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out is like if, if it didn't go down this path, what what would we have saved out of this eight hundred fifty thousand? Um, let me let me explain one thing and then make another comment. Um, the only reason the method changed was because the contractor filed for bankruptcy. So it's potential that all of the legal bills could have been paid by the construction fund until it was had no money. The reason it stopped and it still had a positive balance was someone put a lien on them. And so we couldn't it. we couldn't spend the was it eight hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. left in the construction fund on legal fees anymore. So it had to come over to the town manager's budget. Uh, interestingly, has that lien been lifted now? Yes. Yeah, but so. It's kind of the same issue. All the money is kind of the same thing, just whether it was spent out of the construction fund or in a different way, it was just all really the same kind of money. I do feel somewhat obliged to point out, and for those of you that were involved in executive sessions, you'll know, we only spent 33000 on current town council, and yep. he's the one that broke the log jam. It abs absolutely, it was the bargain of the century. Absolutely. So <coughs> it's, it's worth me saying that, just because he's a lawyer and all lawyers are bad. <laughs> but but in his case, the thirty-five thousand was extremely well spent, and honestly, if he'd been here ten years ago, this never would have. We, when you stop to think about the fact that we were clocking off a thousand dollars a day oh, of interest yeah. expenses, right. yeah. the fact that Ray was, we were able to spend thirty-five thousand dollars on Ray, and probably save months, if not years, of continued daily thousand dollar interest expenses that were racking up by statutory number. Mm -hmm. uh, it's stunning. And, and I brought him in reluctantly. He was the second lawyer in, if you will, and I said this has just got to stop. <coughs> so. so assuming all this comes to you know pass and we we get our million odd dollars in MSBA, um, does that go to reducing the debt on uh, on the settlement? Where, where does that million dollars go? Does it go to free cash? Does it go I, to this project? Is it partly, I better discuss that with you offline because this is a subject that could, you know, cause twenty-five thousand residents to fall asleep, and it would take about three hours to explain. It's really complicated. I've heard the story. You want to? <laughs> I'd be happy to tell it to you. But okay. I've heard the story. I think it's, it's an important. I mean, for I, and I, I wish I, I probably need to find a way to explain it in simple terms at November town meeting to a degree. So. I mean, we're getting a million dollars back. It's important for us to know where it's being used. Yeah. So if we're done speaking of this, I just wanted to draw your attention to the last page of the two-page packet I gave you. Um, so apparently, I believe it was about a month ago that there was some concern about the whereabouts of some HVAC um, donations, um, which I had no <coughs> knowledge of prior to them being mentioned here at a Board of Selectmen meeting, so I went in search. And what we discovered was um, these donations that a track was collecting were actually going and being filtered through um, a school donation account. And they were keeping track of them offline in a spreadsheet, and knowing that they were earmarked for the you know, Martin Luther King um, event that they hold every year. And so what you have in front of you is basically an accounting of all of those funds that actually um, had come in. But I wasn't aware of them because they were kind of running through a general donation account. Um, and it wasn't separated in any way, so I had to work with Gail to, to find out where is this money, because I'm hearing that they've got donations. People know that these donations have happened. They've done these events based on it, but I didn't know where the money was. So right now they are currently in this $1,392.97 that remains is in a general donation account on the school side. What we're proposing, based on what I um, discussed with DOR, is if you accept those funds, um, tonight as a board um, and acknowledge that I can set up um, a separate special revenue fund so they're segregated and by themselves so that they're clear and distinct. I can do that, but I do need a vote of this board to do that um, because I don't agree that it should be on the school side because <coughs> the HRAC um, right. committee actually answers to this board, not the school committee. So I'd prefer to see it um, being moved over to the town side. Not that it was mismanaged in any way by no. the school, but just because it, it needs to be where that board Proper accounting. So, so the motion so you're looking be for a motion to okay. accept uh, the, the, six, the 6575 as a gift? Well, it's no, the thir that's the end balance, which is the 1392.97. So this is an accounting oh, of right. all the donations coming in and all the expenses. Yes. And so the ending balance is the available balance. 
If you make a motion to accept that balance, I can set up a fund on our side, move the money over from the school side into its own and distinct right. account, and now it's in the right place. Okay. Do I have a motion? Uh, so move. Uh, is that you have enough, Caitlin? On that? Uh, yeah, I'll figure it out. Okay. 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 Second. We have a second. Bob? Um, I mentioned to John before the meeting, uh, but to see you all here. Um, John Doherty offered to be here tonight. He's in total agreement with everything that Sharon has said, and the money mm -hmm. should be moved. Um, just to embellish a little bit, the clergy association used to run the Martin Luther King event, and one December he learned it was not going to continue two or three years ago, so he stepped in personally and made sure it would continue. And that's kind of how it got the flow of <coughs> money going to the school side. So he's in agreement it doesn't belong there, and um, it's fine with what yep. she suggested, as, as is Gail Bell. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? 5 0. So I do not have anything else unless you have questions. Yeah, the thing, Gail, there's some interest in determining what the, um, the recent discussion on the, the Board of Health might have taken in terms of uh, employee time. Same kind of analysis that you've oh, done. Ra the raise, time or the raise time. Raise yeah. uh, <coughs> time. Employees time. I certainly can put that together if you, you gave me access to some of that stuff. Okay, I can do that. And again, it goes to kind of what the chairman, which, excuse me, John Halsey said moments ago, which is the town has a right to understand where its money is being spent, and it's seen some of these things. And uh, so you're looking for staff time and legal. Well, legal time is easy to do. Legal, staff legal time, time maybe that would be harder. Than I mean, staff time. I, I I don't know what we gain. We have we send staff to every committee. Where are some costs? So the so the legal we time would be yeah. easier. It's probably the easiest time. thing is the legal. Yeah. Time. yeah so do you we want just that? The hours the video we don't get the rest of this yet, so no. just whenever we get when we get it. Okay. That'd be outside of reviewing their pesticide regs and that kind of thing. That's a okay. separate right. bucket. Yeah. Okay. But just really related yeah. to it. Yeah. Related to the just issue. Going on. Right. Okay. That'd be helpful. Thank you very much for Thank your support. Thank you. Excellent, there. as always. Thank you, Sharon. Oh, I'm sorry. Five minutes, Brian? Yeah, you want to? You got a quick question that may be related George. to George. I hope so. Yeah, George Cash and 66 Colburn Road. Just to follow up, thank you, Barry, for bringing up the free cash issue, uh, which I have puzzled about with a lot of stupid questions for all of you. I, I would just urge that uh, some resolution would come up short term and not wait till the new year. In other words, whether it's something at the town meeting coming, I don't know all the procedures, I'm still learning. But I think, you know, whether it's something as simple as you know, you have a $90 million budget, 10% goes to reserves like we all have in our homes, and it's been called free cash, but we don't have $9 million in our home, right? But it goes to take care of those types of things and to get four new policemen, four new firemen, and do new things for the school. You need an override so that you have a budget to be able to sustain the hiring. Thank you, George. Um, your motion to interest in taking a two minute uh, yes. yes why don't we take Five a two minute, minute uh, recess <laughs> sorry Come on, Victor you were interested <laughs>
Dr. Santaniello, discussion of our senior tax relief. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Pursuant to our discussions last year, uh, we wanted to uh, meet in advance of our annual classification hearing to discuss you know, the options that we have before us. And with the uh, <laughs> senior tax exemption that's uh, new to Reading, we'll have another option that we need to talk about that kind of triggers the rest of uh, the numbers in the presentation. But basically, as you know, select the minimum residential factor, selection of uh, discount for open space, we don't have any that meets the definition, granting of a residential exemption, largely a owner-occupied community <coughs> doesn't work, granting of a small commercial exemption, too few businesses to identify to make it worthwhile. Our tax levy, inclusive of um, um, debt exclusions, uh, is 67 million two hundred six nine forty six. You divide that by the total value of the town, you come up with an estimated single tax rate of thirteen seventy nine. CIP and residential, roughly, the percent of that, right? Are you getting to that, or? Yeah, I've got uh, okay. subsequent slides in there. Um, you, just the back up to the, the previous slide, the second to last bullet. I think the, ta the tax, don't you mean the tax, I think, uh, rate yeah, is equal to rate. all, all yeah. of that? Yes, is that's the rate, not the levy. Right. Yep, it's not the, it's the rate, not the levy. He's showing you to how they calculate. The tax the levy divided by total value gives us the estimated oh, single tax start with the tax oh, levy. No, I understood. I, yeah. I, I not an assume they were all equals, but never mind. Fine. Now, here's the meat of what uh, what we were what uh, we were tasked to do last year: the Reading Senior Circuit Breaker uh, credit details. We had 195 applicants. 182 seniors were approved. Total amount of the circuit breaker income tax credits received by qualified seniors is 181,096. Your options, the board can provide anywhere from one half up to double the circuit breaker uh, credit that was received by the individual. Again, the total amount or its derivative must be shifted within the residential class of properties to pay for tax relief. If ma I just took a guess here, if we did 100%, if matching tax relief were granted, the residential tax rate would raise four cents from 1379 to 1383, and the commercial, industrial, and personal tax rate would remain unchanged. Unless we chose to bring that Can to I parity. Just ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, so does that mean if they did the double, the 200 percent maximum of 180,000, or just 180,000? I just wasn't sure. That is uh, sh the four cents is 100 percent tax relief at 181 okay. so or 96. So it's 181. Yep. And as I remember, we talked about a budget <clears throat> to us. No, actually, when we discussed this, we talked about up to half a million dollars. Yeah, we did 750. 600. Could have yeah. been. I mean, it was not. Because we, we had 600 possible after. We didn't nail it down. We talked yeah. about 2%. So, right. so this is a much so smaller be, number yeah. than we. It could be for a variety of reasons. As you recall, my studies indicated we had 643 recipients of the uh, circuit breaker tax credit but the state information is broken down by renters who receive it mm -hmm. versus homeowners right, yeah. um, this is something new it could take a year or two to catch on um, and I feel that uh, you know 181,000 is still a substantial fund but well, you're in a position it's, it's doubling their it's doubling yeah, their impact right there, yeah. or, or their, their, their you know what they're getting back yes from what they got from the state so Right. So the question in front of this board is what, where in that um, range of uh, senior tax relief would the board want to be? I think the considerations are this is your first year, right. so you don't have the mature enrollment. Right. You don't have the second order effect where people didn't bother applying for the circuit breaker because it was too small. Now that there's a doubling of it, there might be greater. Um, well, there was never a number pointed out to anybody. Only that this isn't going to end here. It's only starting yeah. here. Uh, the third is I think this is going to probably get more press in the second, third year. So yeah. my tendency would be to say do something this year that doesn't um, 
get you into trouble in a subsequent year. We, yeah, we, don't, want to, we don't want to take it away or, or, or lower it next Correct. year. My tendency would be to grant it at the 1x level, that at the 181 yeah. level. That gives you plenty of headroom against the 600k number or the 750k number or even the 500k number next year. Even if it doubles, you'll still be comfortably within. Nobody will be disadvantaged. Nobody will be changed the following years. Had we had more applicants, I would have tended more toward that 50%, but given that it's only 181, I, I'll agree. Well, by the way, I, I could be proven wrong in three years yeah. when this quadruples, and you, you, have, you do have to throttle it back, but you have to come up with a number. Um, and I think, my guess, just from history, the first year you probably get 60%, and you'll pick up the next yeah. 40 in the next couple of years. Victor, can you say, uh, tell us why, um, of the 13 people that applied that weren't granted, what was the reason? Was it an asset test? They didn't live in Reading long enough? Real estate trusts. Oh, own their property in a trust? You, um, in order, you can have your property in a trust. If it's a life estate and the person's designated life tenant, there's not a problem. But if you have set up some other type of trust, you have to be both a trustee and right. have right. beneficial interest. Right. Since Mass General Law doesn't specifically spell out how much beneficial interest you need at least one percent but that sometimes is counterintuitive to why the trust would well, design in the, the first place, first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 and i just wanted to point out you're talking about a thousand seventy dollars tax relief on an estimated average uh tax bill for fiscal 18 of seventy seven hundred and forty bucks although there's no um we don't really i mean i don't know if you can make an assumption that somebody who might qualify for this might not live in as an expensive a home, yep. maybe. So their tax bill could might be, be lower and be more. In which of an case, impact. this is a bigger. Yes. This could we be a twenty-five percent reduction in somebody's right. tax bill. Right, right. That's huge. I could do private, yeah. and that was the intent here. Is Would be interesting to see of your approved applicants, and I'm fairly sure this is something you could pull out. That what the average home value was among the applicants. Well, I can provide you with mass details of values and impact based on the folks that uh, did qualify after we set a tax rate. Yeah, it's set that we have to set a tax rate. I think yep. the question is of 182, if you parade that out by, by assessed value of the property without any identifying individuals, yep. so it's all public data. I'm curious to see where it biased. That's Just all. so you know, it's actually not public data, a lot of that. And the aggregate is. Yeah, the, right. But the Board of Assessors has a lot of privacy rules right. about it. I, I, I would, I would, I can look at the assessment on any property in town. You can't, can. you don't know who falls. You don't know who uh, right. Of course, of course. Right. And you won't know with anything. Nor is it any of our business. Yeah. Right. Correct. Correct. Although it would be nice to know that, it, it, you know, it was like 425 versus 525. I mean, that just would be interesting to know. I, I agree with that. Um, and I suspect it would be a smaller number. Just intuitively, I would think it's smaller than the average number. Mm -hmm. that'll, that'll govern our decision in the following year, where if the trend is on the smaller housing side, it gives you confidence that, in aggregate, you're not going to overrun. Right? Uh, can I uh, can yeah. I understand something? We I understand we need to set the rate. In order to set the rate, it seems like we've got to make a decision as to whether it's 50% up to 200% tonight. Yes. Not tonight, well, but when we do the class. Give, yeah. give me your direction yeah. so that the rest of my presentation right. can be tailored to. to I'm just yeah, inclined to do the one. The one one X. Factor one? Just do a one X. Factor one. One X. Um, well, I, I think that. I mean, I understand some of the reasons that you guys have brought up as to why you go with one times. But when you think about our, our original thought process, there was a number. You know, in multiples of that, that we thought would budget up. In other words, we were thinking, you know, in the five to seven hundred fifty thousand dollar range of of cost um, to to fund this program. And what we find is, at a hundred percent, we're at one hundred eighty one. At two hundred percent, you're still at three sixty two. But it's year one. It's the only reason. Well, this you, is you can do what you're suggesting in year three with more comfort. Can I just say that we're talking about year one like it's not personal? We have people who have applied for this who might not have a year two. Okay, I mean this is a senior benefit, so I think that we can't in a cavalier way pick a number. We got to think about 
the spirit in which we developed this and why we developed it and who's the beneficiary of it. And also think about the fact that as we march forward, um, should an override pass, you know, some of the people that will be most negatively impacted would be 182 people that have qualified for this benefit. So let's not lose sight of that on the personal side as no, we I mean, have this not, yeah, discussion. I, 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 I don't think it's a personal side. I, I, I think we should feel really proud of ourselves that basically we're taking close to 200 households, most in, in, indigent, not indigent, or have the least ability to kind Qualifying of Qualifying households. To, yeah. to, pay, you know, to pay increasing taxes, and we're probably reducing their, you know, if I had to guess, reducing their tax bill in the first year by 25%. Remember, this is not a free program. It's being paid for by the rest of the homeowners. There are so, no free programs, Barry. So, I was going to mention that. So, <laughs> you know, I, I feel really good about this. I, I would I would hope that we would do redouble our efforts and these folks will talk to each other next year and, and I hope we get 400 people that qualify. Um, maybe some of those people take their houses out of a trust when they realize, oh my God, I can get they will no, they'll make their own decision. One right? of the reasons Absolutely. that they're not included is they don't have anything to say about that. They can't make that decision. A trustee has got to right. make that What I'm just saying is that, is that once this gets out there, people realize what you can get. People will make decisions that are the best for their family. So, yeah. My suspicion is somebody that decided to use a trust is not going to be motivated to take it out of a trust over $1,000. No way. No Gentlemen, may provide some context. Sure. When we started discussing this, again, we had about 643 people. We looked at the other two towns. They basically got 50% of what the state reported for recipients. So that would have put us around 325, which I believe is the number we were talking about. Right. Yeah. And we just simply had no idea as to how many. So we left us that opportunity to say, hey, we could do it this month. Uh, we could have this wide range. But we also understood that, hey, the cost to the other taxpayers, perhaps we should cap it. And we also discussed unintended consequences. If we were to say, add uh, double these, and we get a lot more people next year and in subsequent years, these folks, while they'd be getting more of a benefit now, would actually stand to lose some of that benefit down the road. And we were very, um, we had very vigorous discussions about unintended consequences of too much tax relief mm -hmm. that we felt Sudbury in particular mm -hmm. may do to folks. Do you have a counter proposal, Jeff? I, I'm just, as, a, as food for thought, and I, I do understand that if you give away through this program, you make available a credit that might be smaller next year, somebody might go, well, what's going on? But, you know, let's just think about it this way. If I get $2 worth of tax relief this year, I'm happy. If I get $1 next year, I'm happy. No, not as happy, not I'm not as, oh, year. oh, see, one of the difference between yeah. my outlook and I think the average, and I think the average person has this outlook, every time I get a dollar worth of tax relief, I'm a happy guy. So um, if I get more this year, the next year, maybe I'm less happy next year, but I'm still getting relief, tax relief. And, and it's tax relief among a group of people who sorely need it. So I look at it the other way. We're going to give a dollar a tax relief. And if these numbers don't change significantly, maybe next year we can give $2 a tax relief. When maybe they're looking at a bigger tax bill, so that well, that, the, probably the philosophical difference between you and I is I would rather have two dollars today than a dollar, you know, two dollars yeah, next year. So that's just me. Hamburger, yeah, hamburger was coming. We're paying for the hamburger. We do need to we do need to recognize seniors aren't the only ones who need tax relief at times. There are struggling families who are not seniors in, 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 in Reading. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm disposed to leaving it at the one, one X. I see your point, John. I could actually see a case to raise it, but I think one, it's the first year. I'd like to get a year under our belts. We're in the middle of the range. We said between 50, 0.5 X and 2 X, so it's exactly in the middle. Um, 
you know, I could be persuaded to do more, but Barry's point's the right one, which is <coughs> borne by the other members of the class. Um, we said we would potentially fund this to the tune of five hundred or six hundred thousand um, dollars. I don't know that I'd want to do all of that, or even half of that, in one year. I'd probably just want to give it a second year and take a look. Well, at it. make no mistake. I, this is a good thing, and this is yeah. A, yeah. this is a Ooh, very yeah. good thing wherever we end up on this yeah. spectrum of the of a number. It should be celebrated. It's, it's something great. that you know we made a conscious decision as a board to do the right thing for a certain group of our citizens without breaking the back of other citizens. And that's kind of when you think about it. And I, I'm sensitive to the point that, you know, a young family also has struggles just like an older family does because there's never enough to go around. You know, I, I do kind of get that. And I think we've got to be mindful. I mean, 181,000, if, if that ends up being the number, I'm not going to, you know, be indignant, nor would I necessarily vote against it. I'm just <coughs> suggesting that we need to be thinking about this not just as a number. We need to be thinking about it as to who it impacts and how it impacts them. And the side issues that are going on in town at this time also. I mean, 181,000, um, how many homes do we have in town that pay taxes? 10,000? 9,000 roughly. Um, so the average cost? on the residential rate. I mean, in the big picture of things, this is kind of the beauty of taking care of your neighbors. I mean, you're not, it's not at great harm to anyone, uh, but at great value to those who receive. And I think that was the spirit of the way this was designed. So. All right. Um, Dan Ensminger makes a motion to set the... Um, <coughs> The selectman's factor at one x of the um, circuit breaker credit. Yes. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Looks second. didn't even move. That's, That's right. pretty good. Um, any other discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. Now we can talk a little bit about where we think tax rate might go. Um, <clears throat> Just sticking to residential properties for fiscal 18, the average single family value is 559,800. And at no split, again, as I mentioned, four cents increase on, on the uh, residential tax rate would give us an estimated rate of 1383 and yield an estimated tax bill of 7742. I, for the average, for the average single family home, and CIP. Just to label the columns, the CIP is commercial industrial property. Commercial industrial, yes, and correct. Personal. And the res percent is the residential uh, share of, of the, the tax rate. burden. Yes. Um, and you know, basically, I took all the popular options at one, one point oh one, two, three, four, and five, showed their share percentages, minimum residential factors what the estimated rates would be and what the estimated bill would be. And then we have this little stepchild over here, 1.0028. <coughs> so that's what, when you're shifting the 180,000? Is that what that's that is? That is an exact proportional shift of the $181,000 onto the commercial, industrial, personal classes of property, and it equalizes the tax rate across the board at 1383. At what is it? 1383? Yes. So it would have been 8. 1379. Can you go back to your last slide for a second? It's four cents per thousand. So it's that's what on everybody. On everybody. So it raises the oh, average house by 22 bucks a year. So it raises it on everybody. And that, you know, your your original count, something doesn't match for me. You know? Okay. Single tax rate, 1379. Right. But Plus. we have the senior tax relief. 181,000 that is shifted among the residential class raises the residential rate to 1383. Got it. The commercial industrial rate would stay the same at 1379. Right. And if we go to this little stepchild over here, we are raising 
the commercial, industrial, and personal rate by four cents to thirteen eighty three. Uh, I also need to explain that the DOR doesn't that they use precise numbers. So these are precise numbers. Um, effectively, this is rounding error. Right. Um, the tax rate is 1383, not 13.834396. Mm -hmm. They are precise numbers. So, um, so the, the DOR only allows two decimal points. Okay, so the question I have then is, if in your original example, the residential absorbed the entire cost at 1383, if we bring the commercial in with a split, with a shift, of 1.0028. Um, now everybody's at 1383. That would somehow connote that We're raising more we money. have more revenue coming in, and I know that that's not the way it works. No, you would be proportionally redistributed. Uh, redis redistributed. Re Thank redistributed. you very much. <laughs> that too. <laughs> the pot <stuff> yeah. changing. <laughs> Still three o'clock. Yeah. So. Uh, based on the proportional share of the tax base. Okay. 92.8. So it strikes me that if you're a hundred percent on residential and it's 1383, and now you're bringing the commercial base in, it would have to be a number less than 1383. Right, because otherwise you're you're, you're, you're correct. The millage is is too high. You know, but the commercial, but the CIP is only eight percent of the total. Just to say, do eight percent of 180,000. Yeah. That's how much you're shifting. It's rounding error. Exactly, you're shifting exactly. fourteen thousand three hundred and fifty-five dollars onto the commercial but side. It's, it's the best analogy I have to get to this. Remember uh, in Goodfellas, Pauly in prison, <laughs> slicing I do the garlic that. with I do the razor that. blade. Yes. Yes. That's how I even have the audacity <laughs> to suggest could, one point to get the garlic right. right. Exactly. <laughs> could, could you actually do it in character, please? <laughs> I thought it was. <laughs> he is the character. <laughs> you need the deadpan look. <laughs> right. So you take the 181. You take eight percent of that. You're only shifting 14k over to the CIP. Okay. So it's it's Got it. it's really small. So number. it's a rounding error. Yeah. And, when and that's why it stays at fourteen eighty three instead of some right. marginal yes. number smaller than that. And when we because either one of those two that you round yeah. ends up at thirteen eighty three. I mean if we did let's say five hundred thousand, I mean initially that's what we thought right. we were gonna do. Right. Now you're looking at a twenty eight thousand probably around ten cent split. Right. Yeah. And, and in that case again, you as that over to the program catches on and we have <laughs> folks next year and what have you, you'll find yourself in that position if you decide to attempt to equalize it or do something at like 1.05 and not worry about it for a couple of years. Yep, got it. Bob? Um, because of the way the DOR and Prop 2.5 work, you can't do exactly 2.5%. That's your cap. It's always one penny less. Whatever the rounding is, is one penny less. <coughs> so every town leaves some fraction of taxes on the table, if you will, and doesn't assess them. It's forty thousand, maybe it's fifty thousand, and that's why the rounding error is just tucked in that same bucket. Does the state account for how they use that one? Um, we just never can tax it, so <laughs> two and a half is the max. Yeah. So we can't even. Get, a lot of pennies. We can't tax the full two and a half. That, that so what's really? It's really prop two point four now. Nine nine nine. Nine nine nine. There you go. Six decimals there. <laughs> and all this is well and good if we're trying to equalize the tax rate. Uh, but the work that Sharon and I do in submitting the tax rate recap, we can, I cannot stand here and guarantee those will be the exact rates. We could still get whacked a penny on the rent. Yeah. So, okay. Because you're dealing with rounding errors, yes. you have to accept the fact that, you know, a power greater than ourselves are going to make <laughs> yes, the final exactly. decision. <laughs> um, so they're going to set the final tax rate uh, total, right, not just... We, no. You would, the selectmen select the factor, and I yield the estimated rate, but I always throw that caveat out there that it could change a penny. So, yep. so then, is it possible through no intent of this board that ultimately, at the end of the day, there could be a residential tax rate that's a penny higher than the commercial tax rate? Yes, so vice versa. Uh, but I think... I think that's something that we would want to try to protect against. I so you want to round up? can't can't do that it's, it's it. beyond because what's going to happen is as the town uh, financial officer inputs all the certified free cash all the numbers on her side of the ledger it takes a look at okay and actually the recap she can can balance itself and then we sharpen our pencil and go okay let's move two hundred dollars over here <laughs> fifty cents over here trying to get it 
Because you can't put a fraction, you can't charge a fraction of a cent. And so that's what causes the problem. You leave some that's excess system. capacity is what they call it on the table because you can't charge a fraction of a cent. So we can review that next year if it, if it's out of whack. And fix it. Sometimes well, it's a small number, sometimes it's a bigger number. It depends on what the value what a cent is worth. <laughs> so when we set the tax rates, right? We don't set the rates. Well, we vote on a rate. Uh, you're picking a you factor that the factor. Picked a, factor. Picked a factor. He sets the rates. Is there ever been a time where we picked a factor and the tax rate is different than what we thought it was going to be in November? Yeah. And it's usually a penny or so. So yeah. it's but we're talking about a penny or two. Or well, well, the great and powerful odds down, down in Beacon Hills makes, makes that final decision. Rate, but it might be a penny different. And I think well, it's usually about a penny. Yeah. If anything, it's a penny. But and it's because I think, I think the past few percent. years we've gotten really on point yeah, with this. Yeah, we really so. were on target with that. But okay. That's we'll be doing it. Because you want to try and pick up as much as you can. Because you're going to have to get some of it is left. That's right. just the way it works. And three. Well, it's just hope that it's the residential tax rate is not higher than the commercial tax rate. Well, Otherwise. The split makes it a little more complicated. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
get like sort of what the impact is, you know, it, the impact is going to be different on, you know, the p pizza world than it is going to be on Chili's or Home Depot. So I, I just think it's important to kind of yeah. understand what that magnitude is so that, you know, we, and, and then just see, okay, well, to get that, homeowners are going to save, you know, why? So, and, th and then we can decide. Here, here's some other food for thought, if I may, Mr. Chairman. On page 5D6, and weigh this any way you want, uh, for the last three, uh, last two actual fiscal years of projected 2018, the percent change year over year for the average single family tax bill was 6.15% in 2016. 3.33% in 2017 is projected to be 2.98% in uh, 2018. If you go back to, going the wrong way, down to the commercial counterpart of that table, which is a couple pages down. 5D11 maybe? 5D11. And I look at those numbers, 1.59, 1.29, and there's actually a very slight drop projected in the average commercial rate. Mm -hmm. So that's something else to think about. But 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 Dan, to, to Dan's point, there is no 1.5 million. This the two. It's it's a it's an. So what I, can't, I can't take a picture of a property yeah, for right. one. But what would be helpful to see is okay on that let's say seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar commercial property or five hundred yeah. a million. What was the what what was the tax bill change on that? Mm -hmm. Right, because that's really who we're. You know. That's the kind of data that would be very yeah. useful. Well, the question is, do you want to normalize based on the assessed value, or do you want to normalize on the tax page, right? It's which one do you want to um, use as the reference if commercial values drop? Exactly. Uh, well, if commercial values drop, then the tax rate, the, the tax yeah. bills drop, and because we're normalizing the rate. C correct. But if you then if you then set the rate adjust to compensate for the reduction in value. So let's not lose goal. sight of another of another piece of this financial equation. Um, I'm sure you have some general idea of what a residential property has accelerated by in its actual value year over year from the last number of years. Um, and I'm sure you could probably do the same thing with the commercial industrial. Um, so you got to remember that when you're talking about taxes and parity, there are two things to consider. There is, there is the cash that's flowing, okay, which is the tax, and there's the equity that's building. You know, it's kind of why, you know, business people become business people instead of employees, because they're not satisfied with just the cash flow. They also want an equity piece. So when you think about this in the terms of real property, um, what I think we have, and this would be worth bringing to our attention, I'm, I know you have this information, is. If a, if a commercial piece of property was worth $500,000 five years ago, what's it worth today? If a house was worth $500,000 five years ago, what's it worth today? Then when you start to try to balance those numbers and the actual outflow of taxes on that property, you begin to understand that you may be talking about a small increase by a shift, but that particular property owner if that property has gone up, it will be tiny. That you know, so you've got two pockets: the equity pocket on the on the commercial landowner is not growing at the same rate that the equity pocket on the on the residential property mm -hmm. is. So, to hit them twice by having a split, that <clears throat> even though it may be small, I get I get that it's two hundred, it's four hundred. It's, it's money. It's somebody else's money when we talk about this. And we can't be cavalier about that either. And then you have to consider that there's an equity piece of this as well. And the acceleration of the residential property's equity piece, I would, I'm going to go on a limb and say it's a multiple of what's going on in the, you know, on the commercial side. Is that yep. fair to say? Yep. Look at what I have on the board for residential. 2007, 462,000. Now, 560. Well, the other the other thing too to think about is is that most of the residential property owners own and occupy those properties. I don't know the percentage of commercial uh, owners 
who also run their businesses out of there. Really, the, it, it, the small business owners, I would venture, probably don't own the building. Not on chain. So it's usually crippling that lease. Yeah. So, and the, and the point of that, so, so the point of that in this discussion is, is what? The, the the point of the matter is, is that you brought up equity and you brought up cash flow. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the, the commercial business owners, um, you know, are not are not, you know, their cash flow is what is what the rent is. But the people who operate the business, their cash flow is what you know. Is their business so I, I I do understand that. I mean, I understand how that works, but I don't know what impact that has on what I've just talked about in the equity pocket. A business owner is building equity in their equity pocket if they're a renter in the value of their business. The commercial property owner is building the equity pocket based on the value of the property. And as that points out, its acceleration rate is fractional. But it's but, but their ability to make money is based on their ability to charge rent. Okay. So, you know, the fact that their building might not have appreciated uh, as much as a single family house does. And, and, and so my single family house appreciated $100,000 in the last five years, how does that impact my day-to-day -day living? Nothing. I can't take that money out until I sell it. So all I'm doing is paying higher taxes because my property money. Right. I could, right. I could, right. You could I, activate I, that money. Yeah, I but mean, I, I'd have to. I'd but have the to point is, it, so. most people are interested in equity, not so they can activate the money. And you know, you're you're mixing apples and oranges when you talk about uh, a commercial property owner's ability to earn income. Yeah, okay, but we're talking about the equity piece. In, in the case of a business owner, in the case of a residential property owner, in the case of a commercial property owner, equity is built you know, in its accelerating or decelerating value. And so that's kind of immaterial to how you make your money and what you do with it. I mean, it does come at the end, I, I get that. But when you apply tax principles to that, you can't unfairly place an onus on one group or the other. I, John, I, I agree. And so to, to John's point, John Halsey's point, um, over the, I looked at this, you can get the same, these same numbers from the information you provided. I just cheated and went to the state website and where do you think I got them? Did, yeah, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Don't give away okay, trade secrets, please. Uh, so, so <laughs> over the past five years, since 2013, um, to John's point, the tax burden of the town has been steadily shifted from uh, the commercial industrial sector over to the private sector. And it I was think, never in the commercial and, industrial sector. Right. This right. Town, no, ever. I mean, but the the burden is is uh, is being shifted even more to the residential side. So that and and that's reflective of residential property values going up residents is paying more taxes. So in 2013, writing residents um, covered 89.9% .9 of, of property taxes. In 2017, mm -hmm. now we're covering 91.9% uh, of the property taxes. Um, yet, as, as Barry said, you know, I'm, I'm still in my house, I can't. Uh, but that's almost equalized yeah. to the split between how many industri commercial industrial properties there are compared with the amount of residential properties. It's at about ninety-two percent. Yes, I'm. S I think John, what I'm saying is that I, I think there's a sh there's there's a growing trend towards the residential properties taking on more of the tax burden. It's because they're accelerating in value. Yes. The basis. That's yes. why. That part is growing yes. the way tax much is larger than the commercial part. I, I, I get that. <laughs> I, I, I'm, that's exactly what I'm saying. And okay. um, I'm going to say something that so you can all hate me. Um, <laughs> Go on. Maybe you have to fire, fire, find someone else? <laughs> Maybe. Please. Neither the residential <laughs> nor the commercial stock is staying the same over time. Think of all the dense multifamily housing that has come into this town over the last few years. So it's not to say that res a residential property is up those percents. Um, for the single family average home, that's fine. But if you look at the property class and the tax levy, um, there's a lot of um, dense housing that some people consider commercial, but it's not. Apartment that's buildings are not, they're really residential. 
Interesting. So that just because the tax burden seems to shift more to residential, some of that might not be to the single family home. Correct. Just to be fair. And it, it w is what most people would traditionally picture mm -hmm. as a commercial property. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, a big, that's a big number of units. Huge yeah. number of is units. there a way to section the single family from the multifamily in yeah. your analysis? He's got that. Well, yeah, that's yeah. basically what I do when I present it to you. Okay. We start building use. Actually, standard yeah. users and measure at the state that's is average single service. family tax bill. Right. So basically, when I when I think of when I think of uh, uh, single family, I think of like a single family, a two family, or a three family. I want to yeah. own around. Anything really above a three-family, I look yeah. at more as a commercial, yeah. right? So, for example, let's just say um, <coughs> the 40B on Lincoln Street. Well, actually, Archstone is a good example. The, four, the, the 40B, even if it gets done on Lincoln Street, and then potentially Gould Street, which is actually going to be mixed use. How are you going? How are you going to assess that? Is that a commercial property? Or, talk about Haven Street. It's going to be mixed use. Real. So, so that so that that Some of each. that will be a residential. Right. By floor area ratio. Well, probably. if yeah. there's, um, if it's all rentals, it's pretty simple. The property will be classified based on square footage of commercial right. versus residential. So standard mixed use property. I take all the rent, all the uh, income data, allowable expenses, devise a capitalization rate, which is your value. Which is how you basically uh, all commercial appraise or assess commercial property. property. Yeah. But we're still counting that as a residential property. Shouldn't you be counting that as a commercial no. property? Yeah. Intellectually, you might want to, but by DOR. Because I own that, right? I own that, and I, and I'm and I'm I own that because I'm I want cash flow. Yeah. What what will happen is on the um, well, if you were to shift the tax rate based on the percentage that I have assigned, that percentage of the property will be applied the residential rate, and the other percentage will be applied the commercial tax rate. I have plenty of them in Reading and Wakefield. We go to 175. Yeah. So, well, um, one other thing earlier, I, I like the way. And during the uh, listening sessions a year ago, we talked about this stuff. Um, I think the 500,000 to a million dollar commercial property tax kind of resonated with people. They could wrap their arms around that instead of average or you know right. stop and shop or something big. Um, just to you know take a guess at some of the math. Victor said at 105 it was $200 to $500. At the number he gave you tonight, the 1.0028, that's about $10 to $25. That's how much you would be adding to the tax bill of well, the commercial at 500,000 or a million. Uh, yeah, a million. So it's it's, of, it's it's of assessed value. And and we talked about this last year and again, we all expected of preparing for higher numbers at multiples of that. Um, you know, if this is if you are going to equalize the tax rate, uh, commercial, you know, tax owners, property tax owners would be paying ten to twenty five dollars more. Which would keep it at parity with the where it's been it throughout the and entire that means history the of this single town. family home is paying about the ten dollars, about the five hundred dollars. So they're going to be rate. the same, right? I mean, they're going to be the same. The right. average homeowner is going to be paying right. ten to twenty five dollars right. because basically right. we're only shifting around one hundred eighty thousand on a sixty two million right. dollars. So Correct. Would be helpful to boil it down to the, you know the impact. Well, and, and, and you know a shift, uh, you know a shift at one point zero zero two eight, right. effectively right. creates the parity on the tax rates that this town has always had forever. Just because something we had forever doesn't mean that forever. Needs to I get that, yeah. but I'm just yeah. saying. Just yeah. you know, I mean, there's two different discussions here. I do. One wish. is, do you split the rate and try to you know justify that, and we can have that debate. In the context of the senior tax relief, that shift right. equalizes it. You know, that's kind of where well, my head. They're not is. really shift. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, it's the hundred eighty thousand dollars is going to go to people, and they're going to really appreciate it. But out of a $62 million tax levy, it's, it's <coughs> in, a, in a framework of discussion of shifting a tax rate, it's, it's, it's a penny. We're addressing 8% of $182,000 yeah, versus a $62 million. Right. 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 Correct. You know, Barry, I often wish we had two different ways to deal with this based on the assessed value of the property. Sure. I feel very different about a Walkersbrook Drive Home Depot Jordans because one, they're drawing customers from regionalities that have much higher CIP shifts. They're here because they have preferential rates, but in order to treat them differently, you have to treat the whole class differently. I wish there were a, a way Which to is why it would be helpful. That's why I asked Victor to say, okay, what's the impact of, you know, to collect $10,000 more on a, uh, you know, really large property 
um, maybe you have to charge $100 more on a less expensive property, then that's an intellectual discussion you can have in order to basically, for, you know, for fairness. Um, Victor, what would, what would Home Depot's tax bill be if they put it up on, a, uh, on wheels and moved it on the other side of the lake? I mean, you're, you, you know, you do both. I don't want to put you on the, I'm just saying that that's, that's the overall. Sure. What does that have to do with anything? You can't. It's it has here. a, uh, it, what do you mean, what does that have to do with anything? It's a whole concept of fairness. It's a concept of, you know, you have one class of property subsidizing another class of property. And, and, and just because we've done it doesn't mean we have to continue doing it. And John, I agree that, that I wish there were levers that we can pull. Take that one. we could uh, push it. Well, I, I take a few yeah, just to have this, the small business but exemption. Unfortunately, the small much, business much exemption much. would have been a tool, but it doesn't fit. It, it doesn't. It fit doesn't fit people. the way it's written. Um, so I, I just think it's important to, because when people when we set the tax rate, we're, we're, in, we're, we're interested in the impact that it has on individual taxpayers. That's what people are going to see when they get their tax bill. They don't care what your. I get my tax bill. I don't really care what yours says. I care what mine says. So when people are, are getting their tax bills and they realize that, you know, we are treating a commercial property differently than a lot of our surrounding towns, that gets to a fairness issue. So I'm not saying that I think we should, you know, automatically split the tax rate. I just want to know the data so that if we decide to do that, a small amount, what's it going to be on, you know, what's it going to be on that small business? What's it going to be on that large business? And then we'll decide. And, and the good news is we get to do this every year. So it's two weeks exactly. No, but every year we get to do it. So it's still three o'clock, guys. So. It's still <laughs> three o'clock. Um, so I just have two quick now. questions for you. To yes and no. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, some of these, some surrounding towns, um, do split tax rates of, you know, Stone, Stoneham, Melrose, uh, Wakefield of 1.48, 1.6, one and a half, 175. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how do they my, do it? <laughs> my first question is, if they, if they do it, and it's so detrimental to businesses, how do they still have businesses? And, and the second question is a bit of a non sequitur. Um, if tax rates are raised on the landlord of businesses, how much of that trickles down to the rent of the business owner? Do you have an idea? So assume it's two a separate questions. Assume a triple net lease, mm -hmm. tenant's going to pay. 100%. 100%. They all pass Unless they renegotiate. And they pass it through yep. the clients. <laughs> or unless they can't pay it and the landlord says, yeah, right. I'm just going to leave you there because we've got landlords right. yeah. in this town right now yeah. who don't pass it through. The increases because they know the that these that these businesses <coughs> are hanging on by such a thread that that change of three to five hundred or eight hundred dollars could signal a decision to just close the doors. Right. And so that's a get, fact. And then, and we've had business. Forward. We've had property owners come in here and testify to that effect in this room. And so the first question I ask. Um, how, how do these other towns do it, and, and how does that figure into their viable business economy? Ultimately, the decision to shift rests in the governing authority of each community. In Wakefield, where I'm also the assessor, mm -hmm. um, the time and memoriam, they've shifted to the max mm -hmm. to do something other is a non-starter, and businesses know that, that locate there. What does your distribution look relative to Reading? So what is your? 87.13? Yeah, they're, like they're, yeah, 87, around 87.13, yeah. and then after we shift it, yeah. it's 74.26. Uh, That's in terms of what you're collecting per yep. class. Yep. Historically, did they do that in a gradual sense? Or do they, is it, it seems that to be right out now? of the gate when they yeah. could do it. Right, right away, yep. 1980, whatever it was, <coughs> they split it, and they split it big. And, and going the other way, yeah. Big impact back then. 
Sounds like Winchester have a negative split, as I understand it. They yeah. did, I think. That's different. That is, yeah. I think that's because that's they put the water bill in there. Yeah. 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 I can't wrap my head around. I think because they put the water bill in there, maybe. Well, I remember yeah. something like that. It is, you're right. It's something about that. Because something they wanted to basically have the, 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 the utility bill be. They actually taxed. subsidized the commercial on, on the residential. Yeah, because I did this last week in Wakefield. Um, single tax rate versus a shift to 175. Um, saves the average single family taxpayer eight hundred and thirty eight dollars in Wakefield. In Wakefield. Yes. Now it's dangerous for me that I have those facts in my head when I'm trying to bring to you right. these facts. Right. So normally I try to dump that stuff before we get to this point. <laughs> but you gave us that table. Yes. Thank you. I, I need to eat more chocolate for when oh, I'm talking. One caution on Oh sorry, pass these I, I get on it. the subsequent sorry, slides my reach. after our surrounding communities, this one I know. Um, the more we go into Middlesex League and largely residential and uh, this moonshot here, uh, <laughs> the, the, the shift over here is unable to get that data from the state due to a technical issue. Uh, the person who used to update that at the website retired. And apparently took all the codes. He had it as the password. calculated into, and the person that's there now, can, who's wonderful, always a go-to behind-the-scenes person, cannot find a way to bring it up. If they do before November seventh, I'll update it. If not, but it's the a shift it's, factors. It's, it's close. It's close. That's my idea for a retirement plan. Exactly. Thank you very much, <laughs> Victor. Can you um, these extra slides? Can you package this and send those to us through Bob? I think, I think we have them, don't you? Yeah, they're in there. They're all in there? Yeah. For, oh, on the weekend. On the weekend, yeah. Yes. Okay, okay. I only printed out. Still bothering me. From, from what you have, I've corrected some typos <laughs> and uh, fixed a couple yeah. of numbers where I was apparently asleep yeah, at the uh, switch. Yeah. Yeah. Sure we'll give you a much corrected, much better corrected version before the end of the week. Um, as part of the economic development uh, work we've been doing, we visited a lot of the peer communities. You know, and taxes was a tiny fraction of the topic. I'd say the most important takeaway on taxes is that the businesses that moved in and set up shop knew what the deal was. And as long as the deal didn't change, they were okay with it. <clears throat> it's when you change the deal that was the issue. Now, naturally, if you change something in their favor, no one's going to mind. <laughs> yeah. um, or if you change it so radically. I yeah. totally understand. The average factor in our peer communities is 1.25, mathematically. And that includes us in North Reading, they're at one, and there's a couple others, Winchester, that's negative. That has nothing to do with how you change a tax rate and what impact it has on the existing business community you have. You know, in Wakefield, they moved in with a 1.75. They set up shop. They know the rules. On you go. Reading moved in with a 1.0. Did different businesses move in? Maybe. We don't know. But it's um, Burlington experience this and explained it quite well. They have so much commercial that when commercial property actually goes way up or way down, it really kind of ruins their tax bill. Yeah, um, especially down. <laughs> when it goes down, the residence, residential tax bill can soar right. without any split. It's like it's just, you know, that's yeah. the commercials now you live by, portion, you, you, but you, it's smaller. you live by the mall, you die by the mall. Yeah, so a few years ago, the average tax bill in residential went up over $1,000 through no fault of anyone other than yeah. commercial, we had a recession. Right. Um, so it's not the level, I understand the intellectual argument, but it's really the change. And if you were a business owner, you moved into a town, you understand that. To cost of doing so actually, that's a good point. So strategically, right? I mean, here it is. We're trying to to, to grow our CIP, right? We're twelve million dollars below the average of our peers. Um, in 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 Andrew's travels, not this Andrew, our other Andrew, um, and he's talking to develop developers or uh, investors. The the, ta the taxes come up. Um, since he's dealing with developers and the top level people, it's a minor factor at the most. But he's not dealing with someone who's setting up a business, right. which it may be a different answer. That's a great point. <clears throat> but for someone buying the property, developing the property, per perhaps keeping on as an owner and renting it out, not a big factor at all. Okay. And another thing, for commercial properties, taxes are cost of doing business that is accounted for vis-a-vis -vis the capitalization rate that's developed when you value the property. Right. You add the tax factor in. Yeah. They'll try to take it above the line. Um, no, 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 no. Well, it's part of this here in Hawaii. Exactly. So, yeah. so if Jordans were to suddenly have a 1.75 factor, 
they would still complain to him. They're going to complain to him no matter what. But compared to all their other stores and their other right. valuations, they're not going to complain. And again, you've hit on the issue. It's not Jordan's or Home Depot that's the issue. It's, it's they're not going to move businesses. businesses. That's not the point. Right. Right. Well, and they're, they're drawing from customers that are already in reasonably high And most quality. of the people that own a five hundred or $700,000 building are not going to sell it. Right. But the businesses that occupy that right. that's the impact. Yep. may yep. just fall off the edge. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that's something you got to be prepared to deal with, you know. Yeah, but as we, you know, as we try to develop the downtown and 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 have more people living there, have more people working there, there's more support for those businesses. There's more, so it's just a question of a chicken and an egg. I mean, at a certain point, you know, at, at what at what percentage of commercial versus industrial, uh, commercial versus residential, does it make sense? Where is it a no-brainer to shift the tax rate? We're at 92. Is it 89? Is it is it 89? But now we have two million dollars of growth downtown. I, 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 I'm asking. I don't know. And the I answer. don't know the answer to that. Um, but I do think that this is a. As we are right now, we're talking in a spirited way, and we do it every year. And I think we should always do it every year because I think it gets us to a to a, a generally good good conclusion. The conversation. The. I, I do think, Barry, that you know, our goal, one of our goals, is to create economic development in a way that we can actually have, you know, a more open discussion to look at what some of our peers are doing, as far as splits are concerned. I'm not sure that we're there. I mean, we're. I think, you know, you don't. You don't put the cart in front of the horse. I mean, we are yeah, pulling I mean, ahead, also, trying to, you know, develop economically, and we've got a couple of one project that's getting ready to go in the ground, two projects ready to go in the ground, and another one that's, you know, in that phase of getting closer to that. Um, that could have a material change in how you look at this one year, two years, three years from now. No, it's all yeah. No, I'm. I agree. There's something else. It's not apropos of nothing, but it is related. Um, how many times the assessed valuation of Jordan's and uh, Home Depot do you believe is contained in Reading Woods? It's a multiple. I'm sorry. I, I, how many I, times I, more is that assessed? Than, oh, in other words, kind of. Yeah, uh, I know the answer. It's almost three. Factor of three. You take those two businesses over there, you take Reading Woods. There's about 125, 130 million over here. 40, 50 million over here. Yeah. So, so the, don't feel bad about our CIP lack. Of so, wait, so the co so the commercial, it, it's assessed. For it's high. it's hard to top what we've done over there, and we have a lot more ability to grow that part of our. Right. Yeah. So it's so. it's not that we've done a bad thing there at all. No, I, yeah. just it's a it's a question of you know when can we, you know. Yeah. And you always want to grow the CIP. Don't feel bad okay. that we haven't. Any other questions before we said Victor for? Sure. <laughs> There's a question. I'm there. sorry, Vanessa. You should set up front so you can. November 7th. We have a hearing. That full survey will be up on the 14th. What you've got is uh, comments only on question 13. So there's right. actually a, a, a rich set of other comments you haven't seen yet. But. Agreed. I, I just I think it pulls into the discussion of the overrides. Okay. So so that information will be available to us after we make a decision about the split tax rate. Um, yes. Yeah, we have to do this by. Fiat, right? By the on the state, yeah. yeah. So we have to be on the tax, right? Yeah. And we're going to do whatever. But there's there's information in that venue anyway okay. that, that yeah. we can look at. Anything else? That's all. Thank you. Thanks.
Victor, thank you. Well, thank you. You're free to go. Yeah, I, mean, I can sleep here if you want. Yeah. I, I mean, so on. So on the fourth, I don't know, fourth, seventh, seventh. Then basically, you'll come up with a, little, a couple of more different charts, and then then Bring we just have to sell. Bring some more garlic. A razor blade. I'll have the bathrobe, the razor blade, and the garlic. No, 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 no razor blades. No, razor blade. no, 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 bath, no bathrobe, please. Thank you, Bob. Send, Thank you. This ends the comedy segment for this evening. We're back to business. If anyone has any questions, feel free to email me independently, and I'll happy to assemble whatever I can. All right. Thank you. Okay. We've lost. You know, I'll play to me, Jerry. I'm sorry. Send that presentation to me. Just please do. Yes, please do. Why don't we uh, move on to the discussion of depot and compost sticker fees. You guys might remember that um, yep. a few weeks ago we talked about this in general terms. And the package from Thursday is a yep. broader discussion. Memo from Bob. Same thing, I guess. <clears throat> Just also looking for something from tonight. Yep. be right here. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a summary that was shared, as you can see, at a, a prior meeting um, that just outlined some thoughts of, of the town accountant primarily and slightly myself in terms of pricing. Um, just to go over something that um, I did review with the chair and the vice chair, selectmen don't set fees very often um, or you don't change fees very often. Um, there's no legal requirement for the board to hold a hearing to set a fee. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally the board has done that in the past quite often it has not done that that's completely your decision this is nothing to do with laws um, when you change the ambulance billing or, or ambulance fees I should say there was no hearing but right. typically when you have liquor licenses there's a hearing because of the liquor license and if you choose yeah, to change the fees point. then it's in a hearing mm -hmm. there's no right or wrong way to do it right. just to be clear um, although you don't absolutely have to set the fees tonight, it's going to be helpful for the community to know, I'm quite sure. Yeah. Um, we've ordered the stickers. The police chief's ordered 2,000 of one kind, 4,000 of another. Um, he said people will start coming in just before Thanksgiving and possibly as soon as the first week in November. Um, if you're not going to set the fee tonight and you choose to have a hearing at a future meeting, presumably the next one, that's okay, but you have to announce that clearly tonight. So if people come to the police station expecting a bias sticker, right. they know they right. can't. So we right. don't have the price yet. Conversely, it's fine if you have some agreement and want to set the price tonight. Yep. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. So I think there's two questions. What's the sense of the board in terms of setting the price tonight versus having a hearing at a later date? I'd be interested in your input. John? I think we could set the rates tonight. I'd be fine with that. I'm okay. open to a hearing. Sure. Um, we, well, we, we've, yeah. we've had a lot of public discussion about this, so it's not like we would be surprising people. I think we've talked about this in at least two other meetings, yeah. and uh, I'm pretty forthright about uh, okay. what, what we're thinking about. So I'm prepared to okay. move forward. Barry? I mean, it's always good to get input from folks, but I think I think a lot of the input we already got, if you yeah. just read some of those yep. comments, sure. they said, you know, think of a way to raise money other than taxes and um, we've been talking about this for a long time I, I would venture to, to guess if we had a public hearing um, people would come in those people who don't yeah. use the yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't you don't take the commuter rail will say raise the fee those it's people who use it every, guy, <laughs> every day will say don't raise the fee so you know we just saved a few hours <laughs> well don't we know I mean I just this is a question I guess I'm directing to you, Bob? I just want to stay on the topic, John, of whether or not you guys want to discuss this to oh, okay. close tonight or what you want to hear. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd like to have a, a hearing when we raise fees. That said, um, I understand the, the time sensitive nature of this. I, I guess I'd like to know my, my concern is I'm not opposed to raising fees when the cost of the service has gone up. Um, I, I just want to make sure that we are not perceived or, or, or actually doing uh, as targeting one um, set of users of a certain service, the parking and compost, and not looking at the other services we provide. I mean, I, I asked Bob some questions about this too, and, and we'll hear more from department heads and the fees that they charge and what the services, what it costs to provide those services. I just want us to get a sense from the board of we'll keep an open mind for other fees so it's a, it's a more, it's a, 
there's more parity, there's a little more fairness across the board of, of not just putting this on commuters. Um, well, that's who would pay the fee is commuters. No, I understand, but there are other fees that we charge to other users for other services. Right. That we provide, right. right. But all of them are user fees borne by the beneficiary of the service. Yes, and and but well, we did we did talk about though at some yeah, point we, we raised the like looking fees. at where you know where else could yeah. where else does it make sense where else are we under market? Well, we raised recreational fees without a hearing, mm -hmm. right. right? And you know we did that to tied to a, a a study by the yeah. recreation committee who came right. back to us and said this is where they ought to be based on what everybody else. Is and doing. it does not mean we're not transparent just because we don't have a hearing. No, we're no, we're not pretty not, free about. Yeah, no, I mean, we've comment. we've. Yeah. we've posted this uh, right. on, on our website. And in terms of the cost of this, you raise a good point, Andrew. The cost of running the compost, as I understand it, for the thousand or so stickers, is that the right number, of folks that awesome. use it, yeah. Yeah. is about $27 right. yeah, per sticker. All, so right. charging, approximating the actual cost isn't yeah. bad. Right. And the parking is a little harder because you don't necessarily, adding up all the costs of maintaining well, and securing and... But he did. Correct. Yeah. And so you've got a range of values there that you can do. You can see we're well under market right today. Right? We, we call this the depot sticker. This is actually a sticker that enables you to park in the depot lot or anywhere on the street where there's a time restriction. Is that correct? Right? Right. Right. So it's well beyond the depot. I don't even know if we put any fraction of the maintaining those space. Is that behind? Oh, yeah. A little bit harder That's to good point. quantify that. Good point. Because you've got to take care of those because of the street. It will also yeah. apply to other places in yeah. town beyond the, the depot. Right. You know, yeah, so, for example, we put in place a a residential stickers yeah. down by the baseball where, and where tennis court. There's a sign, John. Yep. It says yeah. no parking, 6 right. to 11. You're right. That's, mm -hmm. that's so, where a sticker will work. I do think that, um, Bob, you know, as memory serves me, this discussion was only a couple of weeks ago, we have a, you know, we have a bogey that we can work with mm -hmm. around what the real costs are. And we can't, with any of our fees, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Bob, we can't create profit centers. No, right. We can cover expenses. Yes. That's what fees are kind of about. So it's it's not like you can build this war chest of money. Um, it's it's only to offset real expenses. Unlike the tea, who can gouge you? <laughs> well, we actually have the opposite problem today, where the fee doesn't cover in the case of this even twenty percent of the cost. Well, it doesn't cover either. Right so now. you're subsidizing the benefit of the delivery from the operating fund. For years, we have been taking from the general fund right. Mm -hmm. right. the cost of the compost center right. that was under undersubscribed from a cost yep. standpoint, and certainly the cost of right. parking at, in, in the general depot area. Yeah. I mean, so the general fund has been absorbing many hundreds of thousands of right. dollars of expenses for many years because we've had this $25 multi-purpose sticker. And so the idea of, and we have talked about this a lot, and we've been talking about it for a year. And a year ago, when we wanted to start to talk about it, we were too late, right? you know, because yeah. the stickers had already been ordered, it was a one size fits all, and right. so right. we swore to each other right. that we would get this done next time around, you know, before we had another, you know, sunsetting on that. And it sounds like we've already, we have accomplished the, the difference in sticker. Yeah, but now we just have to, in order to sell them, we, we need to set the so price. So my, my sense of the board is folks are generally okay with setting a value to them. Yes. Okay. I am. Yeah. So yeah. what's the sense on the compost? Sticker? I'm sorry, Dan. Uh, yeah, I have, uh, well, I'm, I'm reading Bob's uh, recommendation here, uh, uh, suggesting the compost be 25 per car with no multi-car car discount. I agree with the no multi-car. I also agree, not for selfish reasons, because I don't care, with a discount of 15 for seniors over 65. Uh, so I propose a 25-15. If you want to just take a sense of where we're at, I think probably What's the fun. sense of the board. I'd say that, and then 125 for the commuter, 100 for senior. Following the same recommendations. Everyone follow. So the $25 sticker today would be split into two. The compost would be 25. No multi-car discount. Seniors would be 15. 15. The uh, commuter will be 125 and 100, so feel free to we'll pine. Just to be clear, the yeah. commuter is a combined sticker. Come on, we yes. talked about. Sorry, okay. Right, right, right. right. That's what I meant. John? Yeah. Um, my memory serves that the range of $200 around a multi purpose sticker for the commuter was more in keeping with. But you could do it in phases. I'm thinking well, phases. At this point, it's covered by the costs. Yeah. Uh, all, I'm well, trying, what I, where I'm coming from, Dan, is 
if it costs us if it costs us two hundred dollars per sticker based on what our expected stickers are then the price should be two hundred dollars and you know what it really what you're saying with a with a combined sticker is that it's 175 for parking and 25 for compost I mean for all intents and purposes you buy a sticker for commuting you get compost for free you get compost thrown in right. well, that was the whole point of it and what page is that on Bob I can't find it you know, well, ten, well, ten, that's ten, not ten, even a ten, ten, five e one I mean ten, if you were at five hundred dollars that would be half of what's five e one I don't I would say twenty five yeah twenty five um, the, the senior discounts fine I mean you know one way or the other I mean obviously I'm I'm one of those people but you know in keeping with the spirit of the other thing we talked about offering a senior discount right. doesn't seem unreasonable right. um, and I would just say the, my only amendment is from 125 to 200 well, there's no motion we're just talking yeah, I, yeah. I, you know I would that's where I would go so, so 200 and senior somewhere below that uh, what do you think if a senior commuter? Yeah. You could no. have. No, I, I wouldn't. You wouldn't? Okay. I mean, you know. I'm open to that. A commuter yeah. makes you think that the person's working. Well, people out to 65 working, but that's okay. You know. I think, I think yeah. ultimately, this is not the right solution for this issue. I think ultimately the right solution is going to be is to think of this as that the town owns. I may be wrong by a factor of 25, but when I talked to Gene, I think it was, we own about 200 spaces, right? If you're looking at sort of in that little parking lot to the left of where the Swiss Bakers is and then that parking lot to the right of the Swiss Bakers, and then on the opposite side of the tracks on High Street right. where people park, in the, it's 200 spaces. That is prime real estate that basically we're giving away for free. Yep. And so the I think the ultimate solution now if we set the now if we set the sticker prices under twenty five two hundred dollars um, people like myself I use this as an example I might go take the commuter rail in once or twice a month in which case um, now I've got to pay two hundred bucks to use it twenty times it's costing me ten dollars a pop now. If we set it to the point now, also I think in your memo it said that there's a, that the chief estimated there's roughly 500 people who kind of go down there to take the commuter rail and park their car, of which 200 is prime real estate. Yeah. If we can set up a system similar to what they have at the MBTA, where they're charging you four bucks a day, and we I just say, it. okay, slots or kiosks. okay, we're, we're the town of Reading. We're not going to gouge people. We're going to charge people two fifty three dollars a day. Yeah. Okay. Let's say it's three dollars a day. There's 200 spots. That's 600 bucks a day, times five. That's two, three thousand a week. That's 150 thousand dollars a year. Which I know the expenses of keeping that up. How about the on, and, how would you handle and, the on street part? And, and, um, the people who are paying it are the ones who are using it. Right. It is directly. Okay. I'm not paying the 200 dollars for the stick for me to use it ten times a year. If I'm paying it in the, in the money in that slot, I am directly using it. So it's directly going to the people who are using it. So how would you handle the ones yeah, on the street? street? Yeah. Um, we don't charge. But, but those ones are a little further away. It's not as prime real estate. It's the same thing. I think I used this example you, you last give week. You a free sticker? We could even change. If we do that, we can even actually. You need the sticker to get in to use it, right? Yes. So maybe we reduce the price of the sticker a little bit. I mean, we can talk about that. Yeah. But it was the same analysis that I used last week, is that so, you know, John Halsey and I are big baseball fans, right? He has season tickets, and he goes to every game, and I'm, you know, uh, I, I have, you know, I'm not as lucky. I can only get to 10 games a year, but yet we're paying the same amount of money for the tickets. That's what happens when, yeah, we, right. when, we, when we set the fee at such a rate where we're going to charge 125, 150, 200, whatever it's going to be, it's we're all paying it even though we may not all be using it okay so I think you know we have to do it once this year but I think ultimately what we should be going toward is figuring out a way and I know that there's other towns that do it uh, there's some capital expenses obviously we have to restrike right. the lines we have to number them but there's also a phone app that people can do so instead of having to wait and put money into the thing you can get on the train and you can pay by that, the that's app. that's all fine and for two or three years from now but tonight we have a right eight, so I'm saying seven, so so that's why I think ultimately 
what we're going to do tonight is going to be the long, the long term decision. So where I am going to defer down to, because I do think we should charge more money than $25 a year to park at the depot, I'm going to go on the lower side. Because I think ultimately we should be moving away from the you know, $100, 200 and just charge the ones who park. Because I'll tell you, having done it a few times, you want to park really close when it's nine degrees out. And people will yeah. pay that money, and it is not users. It's cheaper than, it, than, than what the MBTA is charging, yeah. and it's in line with what other communities I think what do. you're saying is there's a market opportunity for the close spots. We've got to figure out how to monetize it. Right. We don't have that yet. Right. I agree with you. What, you know, what's your target? Well, let, let, let's, let's target in terms of let's like not go there because that's not even right. a conversation tonight. Right. You know, what, whatever the MBTA is charging, make it a buck less or right. buck fifty less. Whatever. Well, so, just to Barry's point, um, you know, you haven't seen the, the town manager's budget yet, but you'll see a request um, to do down to study downtown improvements needed. And when I say that, it's it's Main Street, it's Haven Street, it's the downtown area you think of, but it includes things like downtown parking. Um, so we want to hire someone to examine the infrastructure oh, okay. below the ground as well as things that we could improve above the ground. Um, this board knows that a downtown parking discussion is almost overdue at this point. It's, it's been waiting for different tenants that keep opening, MF Charles, now the post office is coming. Um, so this, this is a timely discussion, but I still think it's a little early, certainly tonight or even yeah, in the yeah, next yeah. year. Good but point. as all part of economic development and a more comprehensive view of the downtown, it's most appropriate. And it is also, you know, Barry's right, again, in our peers, is some phenomenally creative solutions that are going to take a lot of discussion in this community to implement. You know, to go to the, the smartphone app to pay to park anywhere in this town, <laughs> good luck. You know, good. where are you going to do it? Only the depot? What about the rest of the downtown? Hey, you're not allowed it's to a text while you're driving. Yeah. <laughs> well, you do it on the train when you buy your ticket. <laughs> uh, Bill? Wakefield already does it from yeah. the, the Greenwood section. Yeah. I don't know what the bridge is down there. Yeah, that's because the MBTA owns all the parking. No, no. no. Greenwood. I think they own all no, that, too. That's really? Town of Wakefield. Yes, it is. And Bill, Wakefield. what do they charge? Can we have that discussion offline? $2. Really? Yeah. 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 There's, a, there's a collection box down at right. the crossing. Let's, let's wrap this up. Oh, the, uh, okay. It's not the smartphone. Mike Patton brothers, the collection box is there, $2 a day. Vanessa. One of the things that we talked about when this got brought up before was the unintended consequences of the creep. So if we do, as um, some members suggested, which is an 800% increase in the current cost of the parking fee, that those people that either can't afford it or don't want to pay for it, creep into the surrounding neighborhoods. So now you have all the areas around the depot <coughs> complaining that they want parking signs so that these commuters don't park in their area. And now we have to pay for policing around those areas. I'm curious what that cost is going to be if we jump from $25 to $200. And then we experience that creep. Because now we're incurring a cost and we're losing the revenue from people not buying. Yeah, there is the Laffer curve problem. I get it, but I don't. I don't think at 200, if you're a daily parker, that's um, you know it's a dollar a day, and you're going to pay a lot more than that if you drive downtown. The unintended consequences of dispersion of other drivers is real. Um, there will be some additional enforcement. My guess is you have to do it once or twice, and people learn. So it's a, it's a trained response. If you don't enforce, they will do it. If you do enforce, my guess is after one once or twice, they'll figure it out. But I, I agree with you. There'll be an, a temporary. Um, impact of any any rate increase no matter what it is well right now we don't have limited parking except for the areas immediately around in a very short distance as someone who lives on the brand near dudley we already experienced people coming to town, so now we're going to have local residents parking there and the residents are going to get together inevitably and say you know stop all these people from walking right. the driveway so now that's going to be a cost that we as a town have to incur because now we need our limited police resources to police right. all so my concern is if we if we increase it, let it be a modest amount so we can study then the general parking that the town manager just discussed as well as what the impact is going to be. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, John. Andy. Um, so in last month or earlier this month, thank goodness, on 1010, Bob provided some, I think to be legal, we have to be um, we can't charge more than it costs us to provide the service. Correct. And John, uh, sorry, Bob uh, 
did some rough math and, and, and said that a cost for a compost sticker would, based on, based on the cost of the service, be about $27. And um, a, a cost to downtown parking would be up to $110 per sticker. Um, with some basic assumptions. So I'm worried about going, I'm worried about two things. I'm worried about bumping this up too fast um, with, 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 you know, like quadrupling the cost of, of parking downtown. Um, and I'm also, we also have to be aware we don't want to go over what Bob's estimated our cost to be. I think the cost was 200, not one. Yeah, let me just clarify that. Oh, um, I must 110 I was a that. floor of known costs. Correct. And 27 was a floor of known costs. Right. right. But then there's the time the dispatchers put in when you acquire the yep. stickers. Right. And so Sharon looked at all of this, you know, being as precise as she could in her profession. She <coughs> said, don't charge more than $200. I yeah. can justify $200 as a combined fee, um, taking all the parts I know, plus the unknown you've introduced and estimating it. Mm -hmm. So 110 is right in the sweet spot. So 110 plus 27, we can actually show you expenses, right. $140. We can't show you, it's indirect, um, you know, including expenses, right. uh, going around and giving people tickets to right. enforce, enforce it. it. You know, and she estimated that that $60 was fine. Mr. Chairman. Yes, John. So, um, so the, I based my suggestion at 200 based on the last discussion, knowing that 200 was yeah, the a number that you could rationalize. Right. Now, um, Let's keep in mind that if you're going to make that second sticker a double sticker, there's a factor of $27 that's got to be added or subtracted based on how you want to do the math. Correct. So if you're at 100, and, so if you're at Dan's recommendation, for example, at 125, you're only <laughs> allowing $98 to offset one to $200 worth of expenses. Um, you know, that's all. I'll, I'm just trying to let you understand. So right. We need right. to think about you're absolutely right. all the pieces that come together. Right. Um, and if you do, if you make any change, there will be some people who don't buy it. Right. Okay, and you have to account for that. You know, in the volume. I mean, the vo if the volume goes down, and one would assume it's going to, a um, couple of things are true. One, you got to account for it. Two, to Vanessa's mm -hmm. point. If it creates some protection issues for the neighborhood, you've got to account for the cost of that, whether it be signage and enforcement. I mean, the neighbors need to have their protection Absolutely. as well. Yeah. So when you pick a number, it's got to be a number that responsibly covers the cost. Otherwise, why are we bothering? It's just arbitrary then after Yeah, that. mine should be 150 if following that logic. Did you say the 200 was Sharon's estimate of Combined. Recovery for both combined, yeah, combined, yeah. So that let's take it. John, I might. Uh, um, the police and, and I have had extensive discussions over the years. You know, Vanessa's right to bring up unintended consequences, yeah. but in different periods of time in the last five to seven years, there was a lot of unintended consequences of the twenty-five dollar <laughs> price spilling into the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. And you know, this board hasn't seen it, but a prior board saw different neighborhoods coming and complaining about commuters parking in front of their street. So I take your point, certainly, and if you're going to go to $800 a year, you're going to get a lot more of that. But we've already seen it at 25 um, If people are going to start parking in someone else's road, it doesn't matter what the reason is. They're going to, neighbors are going to complain. Um, They'll get, you know, the first time's a warning, second time's yeah. a ticket, third time they'll yeah, Well, park, that's they if it's park. posted. A lot of it is not posted, right. and that's the We'd discussion with the board. Right. Now we're seeing parking on this street. It's an easy enough remedy. Let's order the signs. Two months, we have new, new rules. That's, that's not hard. Right. Um, but I, I just wanted to point out, Vanessa's, you know, conceptually accurate, but it's already happened, yeah. and the price really wasn't the reason. It, it was convenience. Right. Um, I would rather park for free over there right. than pay $25, believe it or not. The guy saving the 25 is usually more interested in saving the 25 than the guy saving the 25 or, sometimes. Because or, 25 was so cheap, there's no parking places left over there because right. everybody that, bought one. Right. That, you know, yeah, I yeah. bought one for every car, frankly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. I'm not going um, to buy the stickers. You're anymore. oversubscribed. So even if you, right, there'll be actually some benefit to this in that you'll get mm -hmm. 
honest users of the yeah, spot. Little free enterprise. And, and to, you know, Barry's situation, you're definitely going to price some people in to go to the MBTA yeah. lot for four bucks a day. Yep. Which is fine. Or get up 10 minutes ride. earlier and walk. Well, down there. yeah. <laughs> the MBTA lot is right up the street. It's not yeah. like, yeah, it's nine degrees out, but it's not like you have to walk down. Yeah, mile. the point is, we know we don't have data that can tell you what the answer is. We're right. going to learn. Right. Whatever right. price you pick, we're going to learn. Right. Which is why I think we should start off smaller see how that goes because ultimately I think we're going to move away from it anyway so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with Barry I, I, I'm more comfortable starting okay. off so so 150 and I think be more in your wheelhouse so that's 150 combined combined and no discount for seniors yeah no discount yeah I mean or you give them the 10 that you give them on the seniors yeah side. but I mean the, yeah I mean uh, they're already paying $25 no. now right yeah. if they're paying for it at all the extra ten dollars is not going to have people right. buy more stickers. <laughs> <I agree. laughs> right. so. Okay, so the, the proposal on the floor is one fifty for the parking and for the for the uh, compost would be twenty five. Okay. Twenty five with a ten dollar discount for seniors. Okay. That one I want to keep. I think for folks okay. that need that. So I'll make that motion. Yes. So okay. one one fifty. One fifty across the board. All ages. Across the board. Right for the combined commuter compost. Uh, with no discount. No discount and uh, twenty five. For under 65, 15 for over 65 on the compost, with no multi-car discount for either. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second. I know it's late. It's three o'clock. <laughs> um, any other discussion? I, you know, I understand. I, I'm, this just gives the engine that. You know, uh, bumping up something fivefold uh, in in town, um, and uh, but I, I understand the mood of the board. Well, I, I get your point entirely. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. We're but not unsensitive to that. Let me finish the thought. But, it, but it's almost like the benefit's been delivered for one fifth of its value for years, and it's mm -hmm. kind of returning to normal. It'd be one thing if it was market value and it bumped. It's been. 10% of market value. I agree it's shocking no matter yeah. what you do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, not exactly the same discussion. You know, businesses now are used to having an equal tax rate, and that's what they sort of base things on. Of course, that's overstated. There are, there are parallels. Yeah, I get but, it. But, yeah. I mean, that begs the question, too, but I mean, are there any other fees that we have on here that we're just giving stuff away, whether it's permitting fees or... Ambulance. Liquor ambulance licenses. Ambulance fees, liquor, I don't know. What, <laughs> no, yeah. there, there really isn't. We looked at fees extensively I'll say five years ago it could have been more with lots of spreadsheets lots of data and fix the ones that were out of line and nothing was out of line like this is this one is way out of line this, this, this um, oh, suggestion agree. came from a financial forum I don't know eight or nine oh, years one? ago oh yeah no it I mean, was the number one revenue we've been talking about one of the this top for two revenue ideas. selling town owned property and raising right. the stickers and, and advertising billboards whatever yeah. <laughs> what would be very interesting is to see if this does pass is what's the reduction in sales of tickets if there's no exactly we have right no here. idea no idea <laughs> I'm not buying it I don't think you'll lose revenue <laughs> no I'd be curious just when right. the number goes down what's the yeah. sensitivity yeah. should tell you okay I'm, I'm fairly certain you're going to sell less than 4,000 yes if nothing else the second cars will disappear so. yeah all right no other discussion all those in favor of the motion raise your hand Five zero. Oh, good discussion. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, town warrant, <laughs> town warrant articles. Not till January first. <laughs> What's the scooter fee, Bob? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Actually, the other thing too, we, we should, should look at putting, putting, putting a couple great. more bike racks up there so people I've can tried ride their bike ticket. Does anyone put the motorcycles there? That's cool. I had a motorcycle. Now I was just taking so it to the city. That's, cruel. <laughs> that's true. My park. I guess I can cut. You want me to try to cut through the chase here quickly? Uh, articles one and two we would not take positions on generally because they're reports and uh, other things. Uh, three is the capital plan. We generally endorse that. Uh, four is changes to FY17. The details all in there. Five is payment of prior year bills. I think that there was. There are none. Oh, is that why there's no motion? Right. So it'll be uh, postponed. Skip that one. So four uh, generally. We endorse. We, yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. Five is prior year bills. We don't need to do yep. anything. Six is uh, selling surplus property. We generally approve that. Mm -hmm. uh, can't read my notes here. What's seven? HK? Um, that's a housekeeping financial housekeeping. issue on debt. This, no that's impact. what I said. HK. See? <laughs> 
And uh, I don't know about eight. It's a tetrocannabinol. Um, that is to bring a general bylaw in yeah. into line with state law. We uh, passed general bylaws years ago that had fines that were too high. Mm -hmm. So once uh, Ray noticed that, oh, we yeah. didn't levy that. So in a sense, it's number. housekeeping? It, it is in a sense housekeeping, yes. And we should probably take Good a night. Good night. So that, since that's our, uh, our police department. Uh, typically, the board doesn't take positions on bylaw changes. It's always up to the pleasure of the board, though. So okay. that would apply to 9 and 10. Uh, not, not to reflect on any of the meritous elements of 9 yeah. and 10, but just the board. It, it would also purchase. reflect on 7, honestly. It's a bylaw change, even yeah. if it's... To bring it into the state law. The oh, nine is fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh. Well, seven, eight, eight, nine. I'm sorry, nine. eight. No, I'm sorry, not seven, eight. Okay. Yeah. So why isn't the bylaw committee voted? Well, they just haven't voted. I don't they haven't, haven't met, met yet. yet. No. Yeah. You want to do a three through eight, then we can talk about nine or ten. Sure. I will move the, the board of selectmen uh, recommend the subject matter of articles. Three through eight Isn't of the November thirteenth, two thousand seventeen. Can we do that all at once? Sure. Okay. Um, you want to exclude Article Five because that yes, excluding Article Five. No and eight is a bylaw again, if you care. Yeah. It's a bylaw. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's yeah. the marijuana fine. Then by my rules, let's take it out. All right. So, so three, four, three, six, four, six, six and seven. Seven, right? Three, four, six. It's a motion to recommend for those four. Okay. Motion is on the second. Board. We have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? 5 0. 10, thank you. 8. Oh, no, we talked about 8 9. We're staying away from bylaws, I thought. 8 and 9 are bylaws. That's the pleasure of the board, but that's been our tradition. Nine is housekeeping too? Um, kind of. Yes, but there's a lot of it. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't met with the bylaw committee personally in a while, so I do it through Matt. Um, there was two options. I, I'm not going to remember, but let's say they had 20 changes. Yeah. There could have been 20 articles or one article. And I know what 20 articles sounds like, but I sort of wanted that. Mm. Now it's going to be up to the moderator. Um, if the charter is on the floor with 20 different sections as part of the four corners, is the whole charter or almost on the floor? That's a question Alan will have to deal with. Well, we have to traditionally stay away from these. But these, these are, in the bylaw committee's um, view, these are housekeeping to keep yeah. the bylaws. I'm sorry, I misspoke earlier. I meant bylaws, not charter. To keep the bylaws within the uh, scope of the current uh, charter changes done two years ago. That was one of their missions. So they would argue this is all housekeeping to line up the two documents, and it probably is. I, ju I yeah. just don't know. And Ray's already seen these and agrees. He right? has. He, yeah, he agrees that all the wording is proper. Well, I would hope if the moderator gets a little too liberal on that, the body yeah. will overrule. Yeah. Well, how do you? I mean, it's entirely. Well, we'll, have, a, we'll have a pre-town meeting. Right? I don't think Caitlin set it up yet. Uh, pre-town meeting oh, meeting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll have to discuss that with the moderator. Usually, the chair or the vice chair of the selectmen. Come. So is it fair to say, based on our tradition, we're going to stay away from 8, 9, and 10? Yes. Because they're bylaws, so we don't take a position. So that means we're done with that? I mean, I mean the, one on the, the one on the, 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 the checkout bags, are, are they going to do a hearing? It's bylaws? actually a meeting right now. Yeah, they're having a meeting tonight, a meeting. Um, informational meeting. I don't know meeting. if they've actually had a hearing, hearing. there. That's a good question. I, w I would have, you know. It's probably worth it. This is a, yeah. I don't know. At a meeting well, tonight, still time center. to do it. I know oh, the yeah. answer to that, but yes. I can't recall it right now. I can't bring it up right now. <laughs> it's, you can't know it, but you know it. It's, well, it's, you, you no. sponsored the article on their behalf. We, we did as a courtesy. They right. could have had a hearing right. until a, a, a David Zeke emailed me yesterday. I didn't even know they're having a meeting tonight, yeah. but I saw from his email. They're having well, I'm sure that question did will that, come up. Is that even like... I don't know. It wasn't very, not very well. Like, it wasn't, yeah. I mean, I wasn't going to go there instead of come here, but I would <laughs> like to. Yeah. They, they it'll be interesting it. to see who went. Well, I'll find I out. I actually had a couple of know. calls of people who had interest in the subject matter and said, they were, were we going to talk about it? Should they come down? Because they saw that we were, mm. you know, right. working with the, you know, the, the town yeah. meeting format. And I, I sent them over there. 
I yeah. said, you know, that's where you're going to get real information about right. Right, the topic. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that's why, to me, uh, this is going to be presented not by us. Right. Um, all of these bylaw issues, right. in my opinion, we have left them alone in the past. I, right. Yeah. I think I we should leave them alone. Yeah, no, I, in theory, I, I agree. Um, but on something, on something like this, it's like, you know, this is a huge kind of thing that's going to generate a lot of conversation. I, I think people would look to see what the board, how the board of selectmen thinks about this. But I, I'm not in a position to say right. if I like it or I don't like it or questions that I well, would have asked that, that ha maybe not have been asked. Until right, there's exactly. some type of a hearing. Let, let yeah. them work it yeah. out. That yeah. will in happen. Case, in in my mind, that will happen at the town meeting and because if you look at this, yeah. if you look at this article, I mean, it's extensive. Yeah, right. I mean, it's and you know, there's some good points to it. There's some questions I would have about you know, yep. or have all the stakeholders been talked to? Is there, you know, I, I, I'd want to know a lot of information. <clears throat> right. Maybe we'll find that out at town meeting. I'm sure. But ultimately. Will. That's where you know. That's yeah. where it's going to get decided. Well, calls I got today were included three stakeholders who it, it came out of nowhere for them. Yeah. That they had not been invited to any kind of a public discussion. Right. Really, these are businesses, and, and that's why I suggested yeah. they go down there tonight. You know, I, I know that they they um, have reached out to the business community and have visited businesses with this so. uh, bylaw proposal. That's not the really same as a hearing, though. You no, get a lot no, more dynamic discussion. I, I don't know. If, uh, it's ironic that Stop and Shop just retooled their entire. I know. Uh, they told them they got rotating week. plastic bags on. You can't put a, <laughs> you know, recyclable bag down to fill it up. Then <laughs> you can't. I mean, they went to the Walmart model. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What? It's crazy. You know that the, the model with the carousel bags. of plastic yeah. bags. It's like what the Walmart does. And, and it totally gets in the way of trying to fill yeah. your own. None of the employees or customers like it, but it was one of those upper management. Of course. All right. Oops, I'm upper management. Yeah. Not, not good. Um, I do know that uh, David or his uh, fellow board members have visited the grocery stores. Absolutely. <laughs> the big ones. Now, that doesn't mean every employee in a grocery store knows the big ones, the two big ones. Right. Um, and I can't speak. I'm like you. I don't really understand the scope of this. I don't know how deeply this, bi this uh, proposed bylaw goes into the other businesses. I don't think it's as extensive as it first appears. Right. Um, because I their mission like, yeah. was not to ban all plastic it, bags and wrapping. Pharmacies. They were reasonable uh, on that. I, I but I, I can't yeah. speak with any expertise. Well, this this comes to my point exactly. I, I don't yeah, think we're we in a position to, they need to, to take I, a I position. Would, I, I would have liked to have been. That's. Yeah. I guess that's my point. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen the hearing to have had some sense to point to that, yeah, the public was invited. Um, well, they didn't call it a hearing, but it was this, effectively that tonight without the word. It was well, yeah, it, was it definitely that, wasn't a hearing. Know. Did yeah. it have enough no, it notice? Wasn't. Was it broadcast? Was it, you know, yeah. it's not a hearing unless people show up, right? Well, it's got to be noticed. Well, just like your earlier discussion um, for the you know, stickers, yeah. who do you notify? You know, when it's a physical issue, you have a butters. That's easy oh, to notify sure. for a hearing. I, I get it. So, so when it's the whole stuff. town. Run an ad in the paper, put yeah. it up on the website. Yeah, make yeah. An that's all you attempt. can do. Yeah. Town meeting will have all the same questions you have, I'm quite sure. All right. On to, uh... Okay, so um, no positions on bylaws. All right, good. We move on to the last our action item for tonight other than minutes the town manager reviewed. Dan? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your inputs. Um, I collated, as I did last year, every everything uh, that you, you sent me. In part two, uh, for the sake of brevity, and I did this last year, and it seemed to be when acceptable acceptability, rather than put initials or who who rated what, I just put the number of ratings in each category for each uh, competency area, which I think gives you the the picture you need to see the distribution. Uh, and uh, and there were comments after that, uh, which anyone should feel free to. But they, uh, Bob, generally, it's it's a very good review. Uh, there are some uh, some points raised uh, that you might want to take a look at. Uh, a lot of lot of lauding of your your skills. I, I think the leadership thing really showed showed this year. Uh, the cogent path forward was certainly an above and beyond uh, the level of duty thing that you did for the schools. Uh, rescued us from a difficult situation, albeit for a short term of time, but. Uh, and, and your general uh, ability to work with the school department and your uh, your counterparts in other towns, I think, is a testament to to your uh, success as a town manager. 
I'll just sum my thinking up that way. Any anyone else feel free to jump in? I, uh, Bob, I, I think we're blessed to have you as a town manager. Um, you have an unusual combination of a, of a uh, non-governmental background, a, a sharp financial mind, a, a good temperament, and ability to think outside the box. But your biggest problem is there are two of you, right? And uh, there's only 24 hours in a day, and even sometimes um, that gets in the way. Um, I think the organization works very well. I think uh, we trust your judgment. We look for your judgment. You're willing to take cr constructive criticism in return and acknowledge when there's a mistake made. Um, and it's that spirit of open discussion, I think, that makes this really a uh, efficient organization. I see if you flip the dial on Verizon at some of the other uh, town selectmen meetings, if you happen to be a junkie for governmental, <laughs> not every town enjoys this kind of working relationship. Some of them are quite argumentative. Some of them are dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. uh, and it starts, I think, with uh, is, is the town manager interested in making this a win-win a conversation with uh, nighttime government? And uh, I believe that, that that's been answered multiple times over. Yeah. Um, so the uh, one question I have, Dan, is I, I, you know, in the in the box that identifies five classifications coming from each one of us. Yes. They're not identified as to who's saying what. Right. In the years past, I think you've done that. Last year, actually, we did it this way, and that seemed to win acceptance with the board. So uh, I think you did. I think I think you did. Yeah. Yeah. I think but right. prior to that, I agree. Uh, I mean, I can go back and do that. That's important. Which table are you looking at? Here. I, I go ahead and put initials in there. Oh, uh, the aggregate table? Yeah. 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 Want me to do that? Sure. Why don't you update I'll it and that. redistribute okay. it? Sorry. I just think as a point of information, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, not it's that valuable. Yeah. Um, okay. And so um, one question I do have, Bob, um, and this, this is kind of tied to the coaching path forward, which I thought was a was an exceptional move by you. Very well thought out. Um, great problem solving um, step for the greater good of the town. Um, it's my understanding that um, the school committee embraced but did not necessarily have to utilize the funds that you held back on. Have those been released back into the town system? <clears throat> Is that official? I'm, I'm they... not aware that the school committee has had this formal discussion. Um, for some time, informally, I've been told that there's not going to be a problem. I don't think that violates any confidence. I don't think the school committee has to do anything. I've just offered it if they need it, and if they need it, they have to tell me. So but where that leaves you now is that you've you've sequestered and earmarked funds. Right. And I believe me, I was totally in favor of that step that you made. Um, it doesn't sound, based on what you're saying right now, that they've come calling. No, they haven't, and I don't. And I, I really, I don't usually like to speak for them. I don't know if they're going to vote to not need them or just do nothing because they don't well, need them. I don't know. I think we should we're ask talking, them to formalize the, uh, that. The money the town set aside in case we're, they needed it. We're talking about for the uh, curriculum. Is it? No, this is well specifically on the town side. There's a handful of expenses yes. that we right. might not do if they needed help in their budget. One, one I remember off the top of my head is one police car instead of two. Mm -hmm. We would buy one instead of two. So I, I will ask, um, <coughs> you know, I, I, I deal obviously with the superintendent, not the school committee, and, and he's indicated a great deal of comfort in it, but... Well, I don't think it's unreasonable for us and, to and just know where we stand. Right, and I, yeah. and I agree with you, but, you know, I took it as, you better tell me if you need it, and if you're not telling me, you don't need it. And I'm okay with that, but I, I take your point. Maybe we need something from them. Says, yeah, we're good. Thank you. You know, you got a lot of the fiscal year left. Yeah. And you know, things can come up. And if you're sequestering money right. um, specifically to help, mm -hmm. which was noble and right, but yeah. th but they've solved their own problem. Yeah, they have. They, they need to say that. Okay. Just as a courtesy to show that the funds can be unencumbered and put back into the uh, town's operating budget. Okay. Because right, that'll. Uh, That'll change our budget priorities for 19. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments on the town manager's review tonight? Thank you for your service. Yeah. 
Thank you very yeah, much. Don't, you know, don't, don't leave because they have pointed to Bill Brown. I didn't. We have to. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Three months is not enough. You know, Bob, yeah, I, that's I, all right. I, I did make a comment here that um, was like, I put it here probably misplaced, but I knew nowhere else to put it. And it was about Board of Selectmen policies. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, this was your review. Yeah. But in this particular topic that I spoke about has to something to do with reviewing you, yeah. but it has to do with reviewing us. The, you know, us. Um, I had a few of those comments in there too. Yeah, I, and I, so I just want to make clear yeah. that wasn't a responsibility I was uh, I assuming you were supposed to take charge of. As a matter of fact, kind of quite the opposite. Yeah. Um, and I and I would urge us to move quickly on those. So because they need so many of these are a quarter of a century old. They're, they're unworkable. Yeah. The way well, they're we're, and we're not following. Is, uh, good news is we've, they're coming up on our agenda. If you look at the beginning of your packet, you'll see that uh, I guess it's parts one and three are coming up. In yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how fast we'll be able to do that. We need yeah. to do one. Okay. One is very important. It needs some back. Well, is that the some background work yes. Yes. we discover yeah. how we organize. Yeah. yeah, we're actually in a better the, position to do three than one. Well, one is also time critical because of okay. Okay. changes yeah. coming up. 1038 guys, that's well, okay. you know, just, close just, strong just, here. Just one other I have, thing on I have one rebuttal. <laughs> one rebuttal. Um, I appreciate the review. You know, I, I always uh, appreciate your comments at any time of the year. It doesn't have to be this way. I, I do just want to say out loud, though, that there's a lot of things that we do as an organization that I do personally that I don't want you to know. Uh, you don't want to see how the sausage is made all the time. You really don't. Um, my interest is in the long-term best interest of the town for 25,000 people, not for tomorrow, for the long term. Um, we may not always agree on the goal and, and on the time frame especially, and that's okay. You're ultimately the boss. Um, as an organization, you know we're stretched thin, but really those only sound like words. There is no chance we are going to do as good of a job as 95% in our goals next year. I haven't even looked. Mm -hmm. um, my personal schedule right now between now and when I see you in December is all financial. I will be fully busy on that, as you can imagine, between now and then. I, I totally understand there's other really important goals to be accomplished, but you're right, there's only a limited bandwidth. And what I have found in the last year is that I am slipping in the level of sort of expertise that I can deliver on a topic. Okay. Some of the time that's fine, yeah. some of the time that's dangerous. Um, so I just want to say that out loud, that um, you don't know all the things that are going on in the town, nor should you, nor do you need to. It's just details. Um, but there's a lot of things that employees do that I do that is hard work that doesn't get discussed in this room. Um, you know, I mentioned <coughs> some things once in a while just to bring your attention to them. There's a lot of things that police and fire do you'll never know about. And why should you? It's, uh, you know, it doesn't really get into public policy. But it's important for the community to recognize just because something's not physically in this room doesn't mean it doesn't happen. There's a lot that goes on in this town. The employees work very hard. Um, I'm glad we have a good relationship. You're right that not every town does. We also have a lot of really good employees, and that's from our peer communities. Um, some of our immediate neighbors do a great job in that. Not all of them have as good of employees, um, especially as you get further away. Um, we're only as good as all the employees not in the room tonight, quite honestly. We can only do so much. The town's greatest assets drive home every night. That's right. Um, I always appreciate your help when you're able to give it. Um, I'm willing to delegate more to you if you want. I know John Halsey has especially been good about some of the selectmen's policies. We just had other issues get in the way. I yeah, totally I, agree with your priority, though. It's, a question, it's just a question of how. I, in, in my comments, it said just yeah. that. I mean, it's just the, the mountain, the, the, the literal landslide yeah, so. of things that got in the way. Yeah. So we've got to find ways to work around the landslides. I yeah, guess. And, and the goal that I, I left highlighted behind us, which you know came up in a way uh, as a tonight issue and clearly as a selectman's role, is. <coughs> Um, communication between and, and among all your appointed boards. You know, we can have a discussion either privately or in the in public in the future, but my working assumption is these are your employees and I have my employees and I treat them differently. Maybe I shouldn't, 
maybe when a volunteer does something, instead of bringing it to your attention, I should just deal with them as if they were my employee. Right. I'm happy to do that. It's more practical. Um, I, I will tell you the volunteers are not used to that. They've had 25 years of a different type of treatment, very independent, um, you know, very non-collaborative. Doesn't mean they're bad. It just means they're not used to collaborating with other boards. Um, that's going to be a cultural change that's very difficult to accomplish which in the short Which is why the work that we're going to do in just soliciting interested people, mm -hmm. um, right. you know, it's great that people raise their hand, it's great that people want to volunteer, um, but also people have to know that there's a bigger purpose behind just, I'm interested in trails or I'm interested in conservation. You know, there's got to be something where there's sort of a culture yeah. of the enterprise, right? About what it is that they're doing for the town of Reading, not just in their in their swim lane, which we shouldn't inter interfere with, and we should get the best people to do it, but that there's something that connects all of these people, and that direction, for the ones that we appoint, come from us. And you know, I think that, you know, I love the fact that on this evaluation form, the first two or three pages is your goals, how you think you did, and then just sort of the goals going forward with mm -hmm. all of our names on it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm doing economic development, you're doing, pol I mean, we're basically, we're all, th this is a partnership, right? So I don't look at it as just sort of, we're evaluating Bob. I mean, to John, to your point, we're evaluating ourselves, really. Correct. Because, you know, I, I don't know how um, evaluations are done on the school committee side. I think they have their own form yeah, with the state that they have to use. It's not as collab maybe collaborative potentially just the way the form is set up. But here, I mean, I look at this as a partnership. And, you know, the whole issue of the communication, I, I, I think that, um, you know, I didn't think of it this way, Bob, until you just said it, that these people are yeah. our employees. You know, then maybe just like in any, you know, in, when we go to work every day, we have to give our employees, you know, a sense of the mission. and. You know, obviously people are there for, you know because they want to volunteer but you know a sense of where we are and what we're trying to do collectively as a town not just in any individual piece or committee or commission so. uh, something we've done very successfully in the last few years in the organization is to if you will break down the traditional silos uh, with employees we've done that by having them work together in a lot of ways even things they're not an expert at just for the experience mm -hmm. um, Reading is exactly like most other cities and towns, where there's a volunteer with an expertise and that's all they do. It would be awfully nice if we had some sort of a rotating volunteer program so volunteers could be exposed to different things. Yeah. Um, we've talked about it internally, we don't exactly know how to propose it because people don't volunteer for that, they volunteer because I like X. So that again would be a sea change. If you want to be a volunteer for the town, don't even check any of those boxes. We see your resume. We know what you're good at. We'll tell you. Go here, go here, go there to have some sort of a rotation. Yeah. But that would be a very radical thought for a town government. But that's really what you need is people that have grounded in more things. You need generalists. You don't need specialists. You know, I, I will say my experience, and I, and I know at least uh, two of you, was to go through FinCom. That's the area where you get, do get a broad experience. Yeah. You see lots of parts of, of town and school government. But if you think of belonging to any one of your land use boards, they're in a pretty narrow swim lane. Um, and it's same with the, you know, our climate advisory committee. Some of them have been on other boards, so they have good experience, but it's a narrow swim lane. What you really need to do is expose generic right. volunteers to more of the town right. somehow. And I always encourage people to try town meeting, especially. Yes, that's have, another great. That, that does broaden your yeah. interest. And then maybe that's one of the things that we use as a determining fact. You know, are you that's a town a you know, for me. If there's three people applying for two are seats, are you a town meeting member? Are you a town mm. meeting member? Right. You know, that's yeah. just sort that's a good of idea. kind of like you took Spanish one, you can't. You get to see it all. Two. <laughs> I do think the idea of shifting that responsibility onto you is not a good idea. No, if we have the committees and they report yeah. up to us, that's what, that's what I mean, I understand. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. at a certain point. Yeah, you know, you mentioned a little while ago that you felt that some of these things you weren't sure how, where you were going to get, and I think it's it's a bandwidth thing, Bob. Yeah, there there is certainly yeah, clearly point, that's an issue. I mean, we can't by default let more fall on you. No, it's up to us. Uh, it's just not the right thing to do. I mean, it speaks back to the partnership arrangement. Um, because I do to, think yeah. it's it, it is very much that, okay. and part of it, you know, I, I have said this to you. I don't know if I said it in this meeting or if I've said it to you privately, but 
one of the things around communication that the wheels came off of, even though it was moving, starting to move down the road, is when you didn't fill a position that you know that span. For John Fudo. Yeah, John. Oh, John okay. spanned five or six that. or yeah. seven different committees. So I, so I put that in my evaluations yeah. that maybe you know that that's something we should look at. I mean, obviously, it's not a it's not a firefighter, it's not a police officer, yeah. but it's it's a way to kind of keep the keep it together. Well, I, in a holistic way, it's an important hire. Yeah. It's not a superfluous yeah. one more person in government. I mean, there was a very defined purpose when you put that position together. Yeah. You know, as you, I mean, most of us were fortunate enough to be able to watch you build the infrastructure that is working yeah. amazingly well, in my opinion. Um, and that was a piece of the infrastructure yeah. that, you know, had to get put on hold. And that's why I raised the point, if you know, for example, that you've got budget that you have earmarked that's now not accountable. Yeah. You know, you could make decisions about how you want to use that piece of the budget that you haven't, you know, set aside. And maybe that's maybe that's a good thing um, to think about. Anyway, I, these are just I think some that random Whether thoughts. we do it in this meeting or, or offline, doesn't matter to me. I think Gene and Matt are the two people you need to involve in this discussion. Yeah, I was going to um, They suggest each deal that. with a lot of boards. So between the three of us, we deal with most of the right. boards. Um, you know, Gene has obviously all the land use and social services board. Matt kind of picks up miscellaneous, and then I'm, I'm there in the background. Um, I don't know if John's job as designed a year ago is the right thing today. I, I just don't it may know. not be, but, but something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, the discussion should be had. Yeah. Right. Okay. Last two okay. items for the evening are minutes. Yes. Uh, minutes yeah, of September 5. Uh, moved at board of selection to approve the minutes of September 5th, 2017 as amended. Uh, you have a second. second. I just want to commend you on a really excellent <laughs> job. These are two tough sets of minutes. A lot, lot going on in these meetings. I have one change. I, I, okay. On page three. September what? Fifth? September Fifth. five. Yep. Right. Page three. Page three, bottom uh, one, second paragraph from the mm -hmm. bottom. Okay. I'm quoted as saying, Mr. Arena noted this is not about what we don't like. I think it's, it's not about um, oh. responding to volunteers we don't like. Other than that, I'm fine with it. I have one as well. I have one on the same page. Okay. <laughs> the very top. Yes. It's just it's just a typo. I'm sure. Okay. Uh, Mr. Friedman asked Mr. Sexton what Sexton was his background in health was. Um, it's possible what I said, <laughs> but uh, it's not. I, what is health? What is background in health was? Right. Well, I think probably it's what his background is. Yeah. Uh, that's what you asked. Yes. Was is your background? Was is your... <laughs> was is. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's getting late, but it I is. think that's wrong. <laughs> okay, and I have one as well. Yes. Uh, on, also on page three, the last line, um, it says, the last sentence says, they left the town vulnerable because they wanted more power. Um, okay. What I believe I said was they left the town vulnerable because they overstepped their authority. Okay. Other than page three, it's a great set of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I think we're all trying to revise what we really meant to say. A very <laughs> challenging. I have no idea. All right. Did that. If there are no other comments, uh, all those in favor of the, of the minutes as amended? Yes. Five zero. Yes. Move right. the board select like and approve the minutes of September 26, 26 2017 as amended. Um, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Um, any proposed changes? Seeing none, all those in favor of the minutes? 5 0. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Uh, Barry seconds. All those in favor of adjournment? Raise your hand at 10.50 exactly. Good night, everybody.